Hello and welcome to the podcast, the cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. This episode, as always, was brought to you by Seeds Here Now. Only place to get your seeds, only place to get your addiction filled. Best in the game, guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. And speaking of best in the game, 420 Australia, Organic Gardening Solutions, another two killers, go check them out. On this episode, we are thankful to be talking to the man on the million seed pheno hunt himself, Breeder Steve, here to talk about terroir, genetics, history, and what he's up to down in South America. Let's get into it. Alrighty, so a big thank you and welcome to another veteran of the scene, the man behind so many famous strains, Breeder Steve. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, and thanks for your uh, hospitality when I was in your neck of the woods this year. Yeah, no problem at all. So, first question we've been starting the interviews off with lately, what are you currently smoking on? Well, a little selection. I had just rolled up a bud of skunk number one for a little nostalgic smoke. And it reminds me even the feel in your fingers breaking up skunk. It has a feel, you know. I find like it's a very soft, silky, even though it's a tight nug or maybe a tight nug it still breaks up in your fingers like it if with my eyes closed sometimes i think i would know that was skunk number one just because of the feel of the bud you know yeah no i i can kind of relate to that i've never tried a a wide variety of skunks but i I think i know what you mean it's velvety it's kind of velvety feeling yeah okay well my first question would be what's your opinion on terms of the skunk now versus when you were first experiencing it you know, it's an old standby, and it's uh, such a building block of everything out there, or many of the things out there. And uh, I just like uh, I've found in the last couple of years that I've been going back to the strains I remember from when I was younger and just starting out 30 years ago. And I think, yeah, I'm still kind of nostalgic for a taste of that old Northern Lights or some skunk number one or something. <laughs> Like, they are classics for a reason, you know, and I'm, I sure love trying the latest and greatest from everybody, too, but uh, there's a reason those ones are still around, is they're, you know, they have character. Yeah, of course. And have you personally noted any kind of variation over the years? Because I think that's the comment that often gets thrown certainly, around. Yes, yeah, sir. The NLIC today isn't as... Uh, it's just not the same as the first ones I've been exposed to. There's there's some similarities, but there's some definite differences. And, you know, within any population, there's some variation. So you can imagine how many Northern Light Seeds got sold over the years and spread around from Seattle before they were even being sold in seed companies, you know. So I think there's a lot of variation. Even within an L5, there would still be a lot of uh you know recognizable but different of course and so do you think that the nl at least maybe we'll say nl5 just so we've got a little more of a talking point do you think that it's it was a line which had variation even when it was originally released or it was more of like a clone type of thing i think there was a fairly stable line and uh but i don't think it uh you know clones can have sports which is mutations through cuttings which is why you know pinot gris pinot blanc and pinot noir were all the same seedling at one point and they share the exact same chromosomes but the there was a mutation in the cuttings which led to the other two they're not even sure which was the first one in that case but i mean with northern lights that could be the same thing where you you get uh, some clonal variation over time but Mostly you don't. A clone is a clone in most cases, you know. It would take millennia for some of those tweaks to happen like they haven't been a fair over time. The, uh, you know, selecting from seed, when you grow a pack of seed, you always have one favorite of the bunch. Maybe you have two favorites, but they're never all absolutely unmistakably the same, you know. Regardless of how stable a line may be, it's not uniform like a tray of clones so the um, everybody can pick a little different one and of course every environment that it's grown is different even a different water source anything can change like you can really taste the difference between bc hydro and ontario hydro largely because of the hard and soft water 
So, I mean, it's uh, the environment is half, the genetic is half of what you end up with. But among the, you know, within the environment, there's lots of variation. And within the genetic, there's at least a little variation, you know. Yeah, certainly. And you just touched on a topic I always love to talk about, but rarely we get to genetic drift. Do you believe that it exists? The consensus we've heard so far is a lot of people don't think it exists within cannabis, but you kind of just hinted that you think it may. Well, if it, if it does, it's it's a very slow process, you know. So there's some clones that have, you know, that I know even have been around for 30 years. So I do I see a massive change in them? Not a massive change, but sometimes there's some slippage or the introduction of a virus or something, you know, where the, like with grapefruit, grapefruit was a cutting I got in 94 and it had no name. It was called, the people I got it from called it the only thing worth growing. So <laughs> as, and I always thought they picked it too early because I thought their bud was sweet, but it was always really long red hair and just not quite finished. So I said, I really want to get some clones of this and, and try to grow it out. And it was I got some in the spring my first year in Vancouver and put them out on my balcony and flowered like 20 of them out there. I think I kept one under a light in my closet to veg when I my first place in BC right after university. And uh, it smelled like as it ripened and got truly ripe, well beyond the long orange chairs all over it, once it started to swell up and you have the swollen calyxes and you could smell it was just like scratching a, a ruby red. I called it sweet pink grapefruit because it, when it really finishes, it's got unmistakable, you know, sweet pink grapefruit smell. And it carries into the taste as a bit, but not as much as in the smell. The smell is really obviously sweet pink grapefruit so it was really nice to find that but and i shared that cutting far and wide anybody that calls it grapefruit got it downstream from me because i appended that name to that found cutting the um but do i see different versions of grapefruit from different corners for sure and some people i've talked to have been calling me seeing if they could get one because the ones they've had have gone to shit and mostly is that they have tobacco mosaic virus whereas other people that have had them the whole time and they're perfectly healthy so it can pick up a problem on the way and in different hands even and then that gets passed around and people think oh this has fallen apart now and it can be from a variety of factors but the uh but do i think it's going to morph into a different looking plant like Pinot Noir and Pinot Blanc, that's pretty extreme, you know, considering they have the same genetics and the genetic drift between those is uh, not that they weren't born from the same seedling, but they had drift through cuttings. And and that's a, a mutation known as a sport. I don't see why it couldn't happen in cannabis, except for the reason that typically cannabis is an annual and people like a vine vines are kept and cloned and passed on and so i think it's more apparent in something that's been cloned over a thousand years rather than something that's been cloned over 10 you know yeah i think it would become much more apparent over time those different clones but i think uh out the gate you know you're not seeing genetic drift on cutting from the same mothers or growing those into mothers and growing their cuttings into mothers. Like, I think you could go quite a few generations, all things being equal, not, not including the introduction of a virus or something that causes it to degrade, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, you bring up a really interesting point there because I, I can't remember where I read it, but I believe it said that there had actually not been any laboratory confirmed cases of TMV in cannabis. And I was immediately suspect when I heard that. Like, what do you think of that claim? Well, I don't have a laboratory, but to, from the the symptoms that I've seen always described as TMV do seem to take down a plant. Whether it's actually TMV or not, I've never verified in a lab, but I've seen, most of us have seen those leaves with the wavy, yellow, splotchy, um, color of plants that seized, yeah. they seized to be healthy after that, you know. 
So I don't know if it's actually TMV, but I know the cannabis community identifies, typically they would identify that um, pathology, you know, as yeah. TMV. Yeah, of course. That's just what, that's what we think of as it. And are we right? Beats me. I've never actually seen it under an electron microscope. Or anything. <laughs> I, I am not the, the guy with the experience in the lab. So I'm happy to learn something new. If we can dispel a myth with uh, science, that's a great thing. Do I know? I don't know. I haven't seen. I can't confirm or deny. Yeah, I mean, heck, maybe if nothing else, it's a good reason to not have tobacco around cannabis plants. <laughs> Any excuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, something I wanted to quickly clarify from the little story just earlier on you mentioned. Is it the case that that cutting you got was what you refer to as I'm not sorry, what you refer to. Was it the case that that was grapefruit or the sweet pink grapefruit? Because I believe if you look up the genetic sweet pink grapefruit is listed as grapefruit cross unknown strain. Well, there's some truth to that because the first plant, though, I definitely tagged SPG for sweet pink grapefruit. And as I was sharing it with people and showing them from the 19 buds that I'd grown out, there was... Um, Everybody was like, wow, that's super candy. That's super sweet. And it really had a very sweet, sweet flavor. And the bag was unmistakably grapefruit. So the first cross I made with those was with a Jolly Rancher male. And you haven't heard of that, probably. Maybe you have, but it would be uh, unusual. So that was the very first release of Spice of Life was Jolly Rancher. And it had actually changed the name from the original. I had bred that. Um, in a creek near the house where I spent my formative years. I've never conceived that I grew up. But the where I started growing my first five years outdoors, I would save a little bit of seed after the first couple attempts. And then I thought, okay. When I moved to BC, I had, I called it Medway Madness because I grew it at Medway Creek. And I had my Medway Madness seeds. And when I got to BC... I just had a few film canisters, you know, for personal use. And at that time, I was always, people were always smoking my homegrown with me because I would never sell anybody a bud. Everybody would want to buy some of my homegrown because it was exceptional, but I wouldn't sell it because I said, look, you know, this is exceptional. What am I going to do with your money? Go replace it? I can't. So when it runs out, it's gone. So I said, the most I'll do is share, let's share some with you when we get together, but I'll never sell it to you because I can't grow enough for everybody. And once I run out, I can't replace it. So I said, once it's legal, maybe we'll revisit that. But those seeds I just had because I, I made two or three film canisters probably at that time. And I, I had a one page how to grow your own, you know, gorilla style as I did. And I would give anybody that was bugging me to buy a bud, I'd say, here, I can give you a one pager of instructions on how to do it. And I can give you 20 seeds to go get started. And when you get her figured out, pass it along and show some other people how to do it and give them some starting material, you know? So it was just a straight hobby play is what I got into. And then when I was moved to Vancouver, having been from London, Ontario originally, I used to go down to Mark Emery's City Light Bookstore and buy Two Live Crew or High Times or whatever the government was prohibiting. So I really uh, like to support his civil disobedience efforts. And once he moved to Vancouver, he just coincidentally was also in Vancouver with Hemp BC, and he was selling, I think, three varieties of seeds. And they were Northern Lights, Northern Light Haze, and Northern Light Haze Hawaiian that BC Seed Company brought over from Scentsy Seed, if I recall. <clears throat> and the police raided him and busted him the first time for selling seeds. And I went down to see him the next week or something. I just popped in. We didn't know each other very well or anything, but I said, hey, remember me? I just, you know, into that pop rally you had in London and blah, blah, blah. I said, I see you got busted selling seeds. If you are going to keep going with it, I'd like to donate film canister of seeds to you. And uh, I remember he peeled the top off him and said, 
those are coconuts. <laughs> They're freaking coconuts because they were really big seeds. They were like small peas, really. They were fat seeds, those Jolly Ranchers. So he said, well, what do you want to call them? And I said, I said, well, I call them Medway Madness. And we we're like, yeah, nobody's going to know what that is in big. <laughs> Medway means nothing outside of London, Ontario. So I said, uh, I thought about it for a little bit. And they're very tangy. It was a tangy herb, you know, a little fruity and tangy, and but not o- overly sweet. And I said, Jolly Rancher, you know. So we put those first ones out as Spice of Life Seeds. Jolly Rancher, and uh, the Jolly Rancher got the mail from that was pollinated later, or pollinated the uh, sweet pink grapefruit cutting, and that first F1 of those was called sweet pink grapefruit. So there's both a cutting and that first round of seeds that was called sweet pink grapefruit. And then the second time I crossed the grapefruit led to the sweet skunk, which remarkably has no skunk. And the story's been told, but I'll share it with you again. While I was in Vancouver, my first order of business moving out there was to collect every single cutting I could find and bring it and get seeds from anywhere I could and just really look at everything. Because at the time, BC was the only province in Canada with nobody in jail for growing. And I wasn't worried about selling what I was growing. I just wanted to grow out a lot and look at it. And I had 1,500 plants from seed in my backyard in the summer, right in town. They would get to be a meter high or so before I really started thinning them out. I mean, it was a bit crazy. And I had 14 <laughs> lights in the basement at that time. So people, and I'd have a live uh, music once a week <laughs> and have big parties there. It was just stupid. But uh, oh, the second time I had uh, one of the guys I got cuttings from, because anybody that was selling cuttings, I said, I'll take some, bring me some. And uh, he brought me two trees. One had an orange dash of spray paint on the side and the other nothing. And he said, I think this one is big skunk. I think this one is Northern light, but he wasn't sure. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, you couldn't just write an N on one of them or something, you know, <laughs> like, because he, <laughs> he just, he was a moron. But anyway, so I took these plants and I labeled them what he thought they were as they grew out. It later became apparent that they were reversed. and the, But even worse, the moron that he picked up these cuttings from, one of the trays, the one that I thought was big skunk, turned out to be a male. And uh, I had like 20 of these cuttings. I'm like, oh, fucking great. But, the, but it had been growing in veg so vigorously. I was like, wow, well, this is a real neat plant. I was really loving the plant. And then when I saw it was a male, I wasn't loving it quite as much, but I thought, well, I'll kill most of them and keep one because it is super vigorous and the stem smelled really, had a gorgeous aroma on the stem. And so that, you know, obviously in retrospect turned out to be the NL haze, but at the time I thought it was a big skunk and, uh, I made a cross of it with a number of things. I, every year, basically, I was taking the best male I found out of my initial years of just collecting all the females I could and growing them out side by side. And then any males I found, I would usually toss. But if it was outstanding for any reason, I would keep that male and let it hit a room of like my favorite five or favorite six females going at the time. So that was how the sweet skunk was done was that male nl hayes male on the sweet pink grapefruit cutting and when i brought it out in the seed catalog and took it downtown to him bc i was calling it big fruit which would have been okay <laughs> should have just stuck with big fruit but mark was out of skunk at the time and he said well because the father is a, a skunk pig bud He's like, I'll call it Sweet Skunk. So he just changed the name on the catalog. That was the only time that happened where I released the seed to something and then they, you know, the vendor changed the name. And the catalog was just what was, you know, my ad space in Cannabis Canada magazine at the time. So they just edited um, the name from Big Fruit to Sweet Skunk. So that Sweet Skunk name just stuck because that's what it came out with right away. And uh, when I grew it out, what became famous as Sweet Skunk now 
was the cutting of one particular recessive. So I grew out 500 of those F1s, and 498 of them looked like northern lights, because I'm pretty sure the grapefruit cutting was a really early version of northern lights. The guy I got it from had had it 17 years who got it from somebody else that had it about that long, who brought it up from Seattle, and it was already old. So this is a several decades old cutting when I got it, and that was a long time ago now. So, I mean, (laughs) it's probably 50 years old or something, if if you think about it. But when I grew them out, they were mostly northern lights-looking plants, really quite uh, stable even, shockingly so which really confirms that I think it was a grapefruit was an early northern lights. And then the, um, but the two recessives that showed up in the room were like hazes and they were moved to the corner. They weren't obviously going to finish at the same time as most of them. So they got shoved to the corner. And while they were very similar looking haze type plants, one of them was just, I was like, if I have to pick a favorite, you know, and I would ask my friends to come down and rub them and not tell them what I think, and i say, if you had to just pick one of these, which one do you like more? And everybody picked the same one I like more. They're like, I guess this one is just a little bit sweeter smell, you know? And they were both exceptional. And, and so that cutting, I shared it far and wide because, you know, a lot of people are really into protecting cuttings, and I was more of the mind, like, I hate to be the only guy with this bud. I would really like to see everywhere I go, people pull this out, you know? So I really wanted to make sure that, you know, I knew lots of growers wouldn't want it because it's 12 weeks to flower and they're used to eight. But I knew some of them would get to the appreciation of it and go, you know what? Even if you go 12, 14 weeks, it makes up for it because of the stretch. And uh, there's a pretty good yield of fluffy sativa-like buds, if I can still say sativa without getting slapped. But the, uh, <laughs> the, the beauty of it, you know, is it just smells gorgeous. And it's because it's a stretchy, you can throw that fucker into trays for rooting on 12 hours. You don't have to keep the cloning lights on. Just root them on 12 hours and then put those straight into flower like six and a four or six by six so 36 of them in a four by four area if you like to grow lots of little ones if you put 36 of them in a four by four area you will have 36 cricket bats you know they (laughs) just stretch they just stretch up into big fluffy glorious you know stretchy buds and they just smell incredible so people when uh you know when standard good indoor in town was maybe 200 an ounce that would fetch 300 an ounce according to my friends that were selling because they would be growing you know grapefruit or i'm trying to even think of what people were growing back there was a lot of big bud it was really a it was an amazing time there were some people growing some really fantastic herb but most of the people aren't ever growing a lot of fantastic herb that's it's the kiss of death of popularity like at one point the grapefruit is a perfect example it was highly sought after when it first was showing up as really good quality product and it was tasty and visually appealing and everybody's like wow i can't get enough of that grapefruit you know and the people that were growing it commercially and exporting it and doing a good job were making a good name for it but, of course, the cuttings get spread around to everybody eventually, and then it becomes the lowest common denominator because if everybody's growing it, and in the case of Vancouver at the time, um, the Vietnamese were growing a lot of lower-grade bud, picking everything at six weeks or whatever, and just banging out. And once so, once that strain got out into the wider world, or that cutting, it was the kiss of death because it was it started out super popular and that would be the kiss of death because once it got popular everybody's doing it and once everybody's doing it now it's the regs or the beasters you know because it's not being done with the attention to detail required to make it special so when the first when i just give it out to a bunch of really good growers because i want to see them grow it you know and i give it to beginners anybody starting out i want to see them get growing some sweeter herb it helps but the name gets dragged through the dirt when too much bad commercial gets attached to it 
and then nobody wants to see it. They're like, oh, you know, a few years later, once everybody to have it, it would just be synonymous with shitty weed, you know. Oh, no, no, we don't want more grapefruit. And then now that's sort of flipped around again as people are kind of missing the sweet flavors because everything's been on this pungent kush kick for a while and very piney, strong aromas and uh, punchy herb, but not necessarily really a pleasure to smoke. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting. We, I think we've been on the fuel ben, uh, binge for a while now, so to speak, with the OGs and all that. Mm-hmm. Mm. Variety is the spice of life, as they say. And uh, I always like, I would, I never had one that I thought, oh, that's the only thing I want to smoke for the rest of my life, you know? I always say, boy, I sure want that in my library or my cellar of jars for the rest of my life. I always want to have access to that flavor. Do I want it to be the only flavor? Fuck no. <laughs> yeah, no, I can agree. It's like, I like Shiraz, but would I give up Pinot Noir to drink Shiraz forever? No, 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 no. <laughs> well, both. Can I have both? You know? Yeah, definitely. And it's it's crazy how many parallels there were between that, many sto- that story you told and kind of the Australian scene in that, you know, even right now, the Vietnamese are the ones pumping out the beasters in the same fashion you described and i'm even um personally toying with the idea of maybe giving raspberry mummer out to a few people but i'm fearful of exactly what you said like just becomes synonymous with shit weed <laughs> what happens i mean it's cool it's still good to get it out there because anybody can have a chance to grow good weed if they've got good genetics without them they don't even have a chance right yeah so i like to get the genetics out there but it's always disheartening when you see a piss poor job done of it and it because it reflects badly on you to some degree because people think oh yeah you know, i talked to this one young american kid recently that works for a big pot company and he was on a conference call with some other people and trying to explain how he was a, a real pot expert and whatnot and I was like, okay, and he, and he says, so what strains did you breed? And I was like, well, like Sweet Tooth or Shishka Berry. And he's like, Sweet Tooth? He, isn't that the Beasters? <laughs> and I'm cracking up. I'm going, that's what a frat boy that looks at booth packs says, you know, not a grow <laughs> expert. If you're a grow expert, that's not what you say. You say, oh, that looks like this or, you know, whatever. You might have some valid input but when you say isn't that just the beasters i think that's the booth pack oh my god you know shopping frat boys you know you just you just lost me as far as any credibility with what you know about a strain you know <laughs> but it's like if, if all you know is the beasters it's because you've just been looking at the shitty weed that people are selling you garbage <laughs> yeah it's it's crazy how many people who are just i call them professional smokers and they think they're like you know, That's right. like the guy you're talking to, basically. <laughs> anyway, so what I wanted to touch back on for a sec was you mentioned sweet pink grapefruit and the original grapefruit clone possibly being a Northern Lights. What do you think is the origins of that? Like just a worked Afghani type of thing? That's what we've heard thrown around before. Definitely. I mean, beyond that, I have no idea, but there's obviously a it's Afghanica. It's, that's... Uh, I don't know what else exactly, and I'm sure people do. I'm sure it's already been sequenced and explored. It's probably in that... Uh, Phylos. Phylos, yeah, Phylos Galaxy. Yeah. I bet you they have it. I mean, I just haven't looked at that stuff lately. I've not been keeping up. I'm just trying... I've just spent the last couple of years getting my ducks in a row to get back into being able to breed in the wide open field scenarios again, and that's really... To me, if I'm not doing selections in fields... I'm not getting my money's worth. You know, I have to pay too much to do it inside to get polluted results the way I see it. Because if the plants become incapable to survive outside because they've been living with crutches so long, they'll never run again, you know? So I, <laughs> yeah, I want to have them, you know, where the strong survive. There's, uh, nature can thin out a lot of you, and it really is a numbers game. You know, every time you're planting seeds, regardless of the source it's a bit of a lottery so the more tickets you have the better chance you have of winning and you you don't find you know out of 100 seeds you might find one twice as good as you found out of 10 but out of a million seeds it might not be twice as good but even if it's 10 percent better it's still a vast improvement you know so really the uh, the ability to start 
large numbers of seed and grow them in the open, exposed to the elements, is priceless as far as doing selections. It does half the work for you, you know. You're going to find out in a hurry which ones can't stand up in a windstorm. And if you're not worried about that, and you, you're happy to stake all your plants, that's fine. But I may that may be a condition for me. If I need the plants that stand up on their own two feet because I'm not planning on staking a thousand square kilometers of them. Or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to have plants that are resilient. And when uh, I started breeding uh, in Vancouver on a full-time way, I would do a selection a year outside – for a generation and then I would do two generations selected indoors so before long the plants that I was working with and the lines I was developing were great for indoors and most people grew them indoors but they were still decent outdoor plants and uh, and that was always really neat to see for me because I'd always uh, just grown in Canada at that point and but I would find amazing tropical plants like out of seed from Barbados. I got what uh, turned out to be original Colombian gold that I've never seen as pure since. And I made uh, two crosses with those. I had males and females, and stupidly I didn't keep a pure line of it because I thought, oh, nobody will ever want these. Are sixteen weeks, and <laughs> so I used um, actually the same dad as the sweet skunk to make a tropical treat line. I had tropical treat one and two, and then I used the pollen from the Colombian gold on a Dutch tree. For, and I believe that was tropical treat one and the other one was tropical treat two. And then in Switzerland later, uh, may, I used, uh, I'd grown them out a couple lines and crossed them later with uh, sweet skunk and shishka berry with each of the, the lines and called those Tropicana one and two. And I think Richard from Heaven Stairway cornered the market on those, but it was really amazing to me, even from the first tropical treats, was to see customers that ordered these plants through the magazine back then and grew them out in northern Australia or Hawaii or in Mexico or Palm Springs or somewhere infinitely warmer than where I was. And they could see the real potential. Like I would see these plants as four foot skinny little things under lights. And then I would get back the customer photos of guys with these 16 foot monsters. I <laughs> just be like, holy <laughs> shit. You know, it was so cool to see that. And, the, you know, it's really been amazing, you know, and ourselves included, like with online cannabis community, we've made friends all over the world that we share this, you know, amazing, if somewhat controversial hobby. And we've been much maligned and persecuted for it. And we grin and bear it and we keep pushing onwards. And even with, uh, you know, when we put our personal lives at risk and at stake, and um, I have nothing but respect for the people doing it right. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, let's just take a step back for a moment and fill everyone in because I'm sure a lot of people are hugely interested in what you're doing right now, as I am. What was it that first inspired you to start thinking about moving down south and doing the big things you're doing now? Well, um, I had basically taken a, a sabbatical from cannabis work as I was getting really fed up with the industry and there was getting to be a bit of a pogrom happening where we were working in Switzerland. So we just decided to close up shop and uh, take some time to reevaluate what we're doing. And I decided, you know what, I was a lot of the seed retailers because I never did retail. I was always just selling mainly to distributors even who would then sell to shops and sometimes the shop would or shops would order directly maybe in a country where there wasn't a distributor. Um, so I really just operated on the wholesale level with them and that degree of insulation was really good for peace of mind and security. But on the other hand, I started having to deal with a lot of fuckery in people putting, you know, starting to print fake packs and putting other seeds in it or their cheap version of it or whatever. And <laughs> just like, I am so sad. And I got, and, and selling knockoffs of them from other unscrupulous seed companies. And then I got to be at one point, I had a look right around then when shit was getting to be a real headache. And I was like, 
there's not a single one of my customers left that doesn't sell knockoffs of my seeds on the next page. Why the fuck am I doing this? It's just, you know, I said, until you've got some protection, like any other plant breeder, I'm going halfway around the world, building out facilities for indoors, field selections, greenhouse production, without selling all the pot by the ton all the time. <laughs> if I just grew grass for sale of weight, it would have been easy, quiet, made more money. But I was always into how much can I roll back into R&D? Because it was, to me, it was just, that's my addiction, is the R&D. I want to keep growing that. Having some money is good, but it's not the be-all and end-all for me. Maybe for other people that's different and that's their business, and I don't care. I don't judge anybody that just wants to grow for weight. But for me, I just want to sprout seeds, and I want to sprout them consecutively, generation after generation, and see the development towards the ideal of the examples that I find most attractive. And, you know, you can, you're, you know, you're only in charge of your own taste, you know, so if people like stuff, you know, that is calibrated to my taste, that's great. Then we we're on the same page. If not, whatever, you breed your other ones. I don't, <laughs> each to their own. There's absolutely, there's no right or wrong when it comes to your palate because your palate is your palate. And I find, um, you know, whether I'm reading wine reviewers, sometimes I'll find ones that they like wines I don't like, and that guy always likes wines I do like. So maybe I'll follow what he's doing better. And it's the same with with grass. Some breeders are going to breed stuff that appeals to certain people, and other people are going to be more attracted to stuff from other breeders. But I think overall, you know, it's really fun. It's it's just like music almost. It's like there's music. But how many kinds of music are there, you know, even within one genre of music, which is your favorite band, you know? So there's, it's really a expression. So we find the herbs that appeal to us the most. And uh, I just feel privileged to have uh, indulged myself so long in doing so. And having took a long break from it, which my children were young at the time too, and I wanted them to have a, you know, non-controversial upbringing as I was leaving Europe and going back to the dark ages. And, and that worked out fine. I do something else I really enjoyed and, uh, and, and was stoned the whole time. So it was really not a, a huge sacrifice to take a break from the industry all that time. And as I watched the various programs roll out in the Canadian regime, I would read through them the day they came out, whether it was MMAR, MMPR, ACMPR, and then the Cannabis Act, and I would lose interest by the time I read them, because I would think, hmm, I guess the, the MMAR came out when I was gone, I think, so it was never really, uh, even while I was gone, the MMPR came out. I remember reading it on my computer in Switzerland. And I was looking at, do I want to come back and set this up? And by the time I'd read through it, I was like, now this is designed to fail. This is a joke. And there's no way I'd want to work under those conditions. And if I can't grow outside or make hash, fuck, I can't be bothered. <laughs> and uh, so, so it did, had zero appeal to me to build a jail to work in, you know. So the then the ACMPR came out, and it still didn't allow in outdoor cultivation. So it still lacked interest for me. And it was softer than the MMPR, but it was still n nonsensical. And now the latest, the Cannabis Act that came out October 17th this year, has allowed opened the door for outdoor applications. So now it's starting to get more interesting. So I'm having a serious thought about in Canada, but about five years ago even, one of my friends that was a, an academic He'd been really trying to get me interested in doing an MMPR, and I kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to bother with this shit. Let's wait till we see something better. And so we ended up making a company just for studying the opportunity and, on the different uh, regimes around the world, and we really were just doing our homework and, and keeping our eye open and staying patient. And when I saw the first draft of the Colombian regs come out, it was like they read the MMPR, took a black marker to most of it, and cut it down to 12 pages. So it was like, 
oh, this is way better. You know, this has some appeal and it involved outdoor as an option. And I, and it ticked all the boxes because I'd always wanted to grow on the equator as well. And that for a research station, that's very important to me. And I love the tropical terps far more than the Afghan based ones. And I would love to drive a combine pulling down sweet skunk you know, for square kilometer a day. You know, that's fine. Let's do that. So I really wanted to, to scale up to plant equatorial fields by doing a lot of selections down there. And in the constitution of Colombia, people are allowed to have 20 plants um, as a personal supply. And that's, you know, you never ever hear about anybody getting hassled for their 20 plants. Um, Sometimes people would pool them together. The regs weren't really clear on whether or not it was per household or per person. And they were deliberately vague, as many regulations are, so that they can be interpreted by the authorities as they wish. So the um, but so we ended up putting a few names on a property, not where we were getting the license and just doing a test plants, you know, trying out a bunch of stuff while we're waiting for all the licensing process to go through. And even from the beginning, we were, we went down there when, when we saw this initially as a 12 page regulation, I'm jumping all over, but the 12 page first draft that intrigued me so much. And I said, I want to shake the hand of whoever wrote this. I got down there, um, August, 20, 2015 or 16, 2016, I guess. All blurs together here, but two, two and a bit years ago, August. The, um, the, the, through friends, we got invited to go and present in the Congress of Columbia meeting with the uh, lawyer who was a very intelligent woman that wrote that first draft. And she was a lawyer for Senator Juan Manuel Galan. And later we met with him separately. And, uh, you know, both really sensible people that, that want, you know, sensible drug policy, really. And their, once their first draft came out, um, it expanded beyond that initial 12 pages but when they tried to implement and gave out the first couple licenses it was um around january that year and the opposition and government had never got a chance to look at it or debate it so they put the brakes on it so it really did hurt the very first people to apply because it put them in a holding pattern for quite a long time um but as after the opposition had a, went through it, tightened it up as they saw it, and made it a little more controlled and awkward for the rest of us, then it was still allowed to be implemented. The current government is less favorable towards cannabis than the last one, and things aren't moving quite as quickly down there as they had been. So that was why I picked it. Uh, okay. And we really made to the, we're the only company there to have registered genetics. Actually, we we made history to be the register, the first genetics in the history of the country. So that's kind of cool. I'm very proud of that. And I'm happy that we'll be the first ones to go into production with them shortly. Um, but I'm not as excited about production. Like <laughs> my partners and other people are, they really, they see the production part more than I see, you know, the value in doing the genetics work. And not just because it's not just monetary value to me, it's absolutely selfish pleasure. <laughs> but you know what? It still works out good for the production team too when when I increase the efficiency of whatever we're trying to achieve. So, so if we want high THCV strains, well, let's bump them up from 2% to 20%. Or, you know, if you can do that, you just made 10 times the production without getting another hectare, you know? So. So there's so much importance in working with genetics and nowadays with greater legality and more and more jurisdictions, there's so many really qualified people with skills far beyond me in molecular genetics and whatnot that are able to go to town and work on some of these things. And some of the things they work on may not be things that we like and some of them may be, but, uh, 
there's no substitute for nosing your way through the place. You know, if you're, if that's what you're looking for, if I, and I follow my nose, I really want the most aromatic varieties for whatever the end goal is, whether it's a higher cannabinoid content, I'm not going to, I just don't want to grow ones that have the smells I don't like. And I find probably half of the aromas in cannabis I don't like in whatever combination, you know, like in some, it's a, uh, some totally puts me off and some totally turns me on. And there's, there's some middle ground, but, uh, there's a lot of variety in cannabis aromas. There's far more than in wine. I forget the actual number of compounds in each, but it is a substantial difference, like a factor of 10. Um, yeah, wow. So, I mean, I've seen a lot of photos on your Instagram feed over the past, say, year or so, and you like to use this tag, the million seed pheno hunt. Is that the goal? Million seed search. Yeah, well, what I've actually working on doing right now is planting a hundred thousand seeds a month so i could do more than that given the space and hands and materials and that's no problem and once uh but a thousand seeds a hundred thousand seeds a month that's a good working pool you know most breeders of any sort be pretty happy to do that and (laughs) it's in a year that's a significant you know you've cracked a million in a year well over and so i put this million seed search hashtag out and said anybody that wants to contribute to this and send me some of their seeds to try i needed a minimum of 75 but now the regs have changed and i need a minimum of 100 to plant um, them out for characterization and what i'm offering in return is everybody that contributes seeds to this million seed search i will give them back a detailed grow report from that latitude and altitude. And I'm taking it to other latitudes and altitudes within Columbia alone. I have 11 test zones. So I have my main farm in one and then one hectare test zone with the national university in the other 10 zones. So that's just in Colombia. So if the seeds are make it to Colombia, they will be fully tested, and you'll get a full report from all these different scenarios. And I will also welcome you to come down and check everything out for yourself, and come for a visit. And other than that, I told people if you don't want to contribute seeds, just send me your wholesale list, and we'll buy a bunch of you. So I really want to try and look at everything out there. And if I can't get everything out there, that's okay. I'm not going to be sweating it too bad because you know I'm looking at tons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely. not missing much. If, if anything, I'm not missing much. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge undertaking to say the least. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who's even attempted such a thing on that scale. Yeah, that's it. You have somebody has to to go for it. You know, you have to to dream it before you can do it. You know, when I start talking about doing stuff like this, people that don't know me well, can be like, you're a dreamer, man. You'd never be able to pull that off. <laughs> and two years later, it's like, oh, fuck. Even when I got to Switzerland, I remember, uh, you know, I got there whenever it was. It was June, I think. It was a little wait to get set up for that summer, but I was making grandiose plans for the following year. And I remember uh, getting a visit from this guy, Gypsy Nirvana, from the UK. And he came over and uh, he wrote a little thing after his first visit going, oh, this guy thinks he's big shit. He doesn't have anything planted yet. And he thinks he's going to have all this going by next year. And he's like, we'll see, we'll see. And then he came back the next year. He's like, holy fuck, I got it everything he said he was going to. <laughs> and it's just a matter of you've got to dream it before you can do it. You know, and you have to tell yourself, this is what I'm going to do. I I told myself, I'm going to get set up in a legal scenario to plant fields of grass on the equator as soon as I can. I don't really care about breeding northern grass anymore. Not, I mean, I'm interested in it, but not as interested as the tropical stuff because the perfumes have more high notes and not the not the stank that the kids are into these days, but it's, they're only into it because they've never had the opportunity to try some spectacular equatorial grass. Maybe unless they live in Hawaii or something, right? Or Australia. The, uh, the <laughs> no, I got that one. Don't worry. 
<laughs> you know? I pe- no, I mean, I picked up on that little reference. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I loved, uh, I got to say, I loved your grass. It was the nicest I tried on your land for sure. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm I'm sure there's probably better, but I'm glad I could hook you up with something. Oh, it was really nice. So most of the other stuff I tried from the guys brought me, with one or two exceptions, but a few other people brought me stuff, but it was usually too chemi to smoke. I, I really remember rolling one guy's, and I rolled a big fat paper because he gave me like a half ounce, and I was leaving like the next day from that town, and I was like, oh, no, don't give me all this. And I really made him take it back. He didn't want to take it back, but I said, I'll let me keep, keep a little bit, but... Because I just felt bad for him because I'm like, surely he can find somebody that actually wants this. Because I, I remember I rolled up a big fat joint and I lit it and I took about three big puffs on it and I looked him in the eye and I flicked it out the window. <laughs> He's like, what did you do that for? I said, I can't smoke that grass, man. It was so heavy. It bur- My lips are still burning from the first few puffs. And I was like, I just can't smoke weed like that. And he, he was just, holy shit, you were serious. And then I pulled out something else that and he was like oh you have something else and i said yeah <laughs> so he's he was impressed with what i had i had more from another friend that i'd met the day before in the same town and i gave and i gave it to the guy with the chemi weed and i said why don't you take this home and smoke it because i can't finish it before i leave tomorrow so no, uh, there you go. anyway hopefully it turns yours was to... the best you stood out you stood out absolutely oh thank you i appreciate that I do want to loop back to the start because all this talk of Holland and all that, we should probably go back to like Canada and, you know, how did you really get into things there and then how did that transition into then moving to Switzerland? Okay. Um, I started growing my own gorilla style, two plants here, three plants there, um, back in southwestern Ontario near London in Middlesex County. And the grass I would pull back there, still to this day, is up there with anything I've had from anywhere in the world. So I was quickly sold on, I am not buying any more grass. I am growing my own because what I'm growing is better than what I could buy. And it was really just a straight homegrown play from the beginning. Five years of that and the... been going through university and decided at the end of university I'm going to move once I'm done I'm going to move to BC because it's the only province in Canada nobody was in jail for growing so it was attractive that way I never wanted to go to jail for growing and uh, (laughs) um, I moved out there and really took my hobby breeding to the next level and ended up taking it pro so as I was in Vancouver, I had opened um, a grow shop where we had lights and fans, but only my organic soil mix or organic fertilizer. And we had both um, a system for people to grow organic cocoa mix with Steve's special blend and worm castings and whatnot. And then we had a water system that was pure aquaponics. So I'd, uh, I started growing aquaponics when I very first moved to Vancouver, actually. It was the first closet I even built. I built a quick aquaponics system because I'd always wanted to try that out. And I think that was the first cannabis-grown aquaponically, to the best of my knowledge. But the, um, I kept doing it, and then and it was astounding, the results. When I moved into the next house I was in, I, was, I made a, literally a Mickey Mouse system that had a Mickey Mouse shower curtain where the water trickled under the Rubbermaids and drained back into the Rubbermaid with the goldfish in it. I think I called it the Mickey Mouse system. And uh, the, the pot that came out of it was so stunning that <laughs> people just lost it. They would just lose their shit. And they would say, what the hell did you do to grow this? It's so different than anything else we smoke. And when I tell them, they were just like, seriously? And the buds were rock hard. It wasn't like you were sacrificing weight. You would get the same the plant would turn out the shape it's supposed to if it's healthy the whole time and the light's dense enough and it packs in its nodes and the aquaponics just made it burn to a white ash, a clean white, not even gray. It was stupid how clean it burned. And so I was a huge fan of that. And I thought for indoors or greenhouse, I would, if I ever set up another indoor or greenhouse, I will only be doing it aquaponically, put it that way. And the, um, but other than that, I really get a kick out of growing straight into a field 
and I'm mending the soil, sure. I'm, I'm not above adding some dolomite lime bone meal or back one or molasses, or any any assortment of good organic goodies. The but that that was it. So I was doing this aquaponics, and that was getting attention of any any of the pot writers. They would come to the city for a visit, and high times would want to come to my house and tour my gardens or whatever. So various various ones from Andre Grossman or Ed Rosenthal or Jorge Cervantes, they would all come through. There was uh, Annie. <laughs> but I'm trying to think of them all, but there was. There was at least four from High Times that used to come through Vancouver once a year writing an article. So they'd come and look at whatever gardens we were doing with the latest strains and and the technology that we were using and whatnot. And the aquaponic system was always quite popular. They it was dubbed Guppy Ponics, I believe, in one of the magazines, maybe Red Eye magazine with Nick from the UK. Um so as I was doing that place. Ed Rosenthal was about to go on a consulting gig to Switzerland for these three brothers that had one of the, maybe the biggest commercial grow operation in Switzerland. And he invited me along um, and said, how would you like to co-consult on this gig I have in Switzerland right now? And I said, sounds like a blast. Let's check this out. So we went over there and, and I realized how legal legal can be like you could go to the supermarket and buy trays of cuttings right beside the dusty millers geraniums peppers and tomatoes they had trays of white widow trays of compulty hemp they had they must have had 40 or 50 varieties of cannabis just at the front door of the grocery store for seven ninety nine a clone or something like that and they had the same little plant tags with a picture of the bud or a picture of the plant and on the back, it would say plant in full sun, well-drained soil, heavy feeder. You know, it finishes in 120 days. Like It was like just normal. It was boring. It was so normal. And, and these three brothers, one of their four farms was a cloning operation. And they were cranking out a shitload of clones, like 100,000 a week or something. What? I, yeah, and I had another partner because they were supplying not only to the grocery stores, but to all these commercial warehouse growers or greenhouse growers that were buying them 20000 at a time, you know. So it was really industrial. They had a couple of delivery trucks with shelves in them, and they had robotic transplanters. Like, it was amazing. It, was, it used to be a poinsettia operation, and when the, when the poinsettia business in Switzerland lost its uh, trade protection, there was a free trade agreement through the EU that included Moroccan poinsettias, and even though Switzerland wasn't part of the EU, they had part. They had some trade agreements with them, and uh, it literally knocked out the subsidies for this poinsettia farm. And the guy, this old man, nothing to do with graph, just didn't want to lose his multi-million-dollar greenhouse investment, you know. So he rented it to these three brothers. And they cranked out this clone operation. <laughs> it was a, a marvel to behold back then, and that was 1999. And today it would still be cutting edge. So it was pretty cool to go over and uh, consult in that operation for two weeks. And on the weekend in the middle, they'd suggested to us, you should uh, um, check out other parts of the country and whatnot. So we went and explored a bit. Actually, no, I think it was uh, on the next next time I came back that I went down. I thought I was going to be up in that area because after the two weeks there, I was like, I'm coming back. I'm going to have a farm. <laughs> this is that. I'm shutting down my whole life in BC and moving here to get a farm to grow it wide open, legal like tomatoes. I'll happily pay my taxes and be a good citizen. Just let me do this. And I was going to come back and go. So uh, I called my wife and told her to start preparing. And then I came home here for two weeks to BC and went back over. And after the first few days or first week up in the German side where it's a little, you know, can be drizzly and gray and, you know, it's all German food and German speaking, which I don't speak German. And <laughs> it was okay. I was there sitting with my German book the first week or two saying I should study, you know, I'm really trying to learn some German. 
And then the one weekend, my friend said, have you ever been down to Ticino? I was like, no, is there a Tessine, they call it? And I said, no, it's, it's, it's the nicest part of Switzerland. We always go there for our holidays. It's south of the Alps. It's all Italian. And it used to be part of Italy. And the food's all Italian. And it's really nice. You're going to love it. The weather's better. I went down there that weekend to check it out. And I called them and say, uh, I'm not coming back. I've got all my stuff with me. We're going to have an office and an operation down here. I'm literally... The sunshine alone is justification of me not doing this an hour outside of Zurich. This is the smart place to do it. It's a different climate. It's a better climate. And they got no argument from them because they said, oh, that'll give us an excuse to come down there more often. They love to go for their holiday weekends. So I set up down there and uh, had a good run of it for a while. And then things turned sideways there when, sadly, um, the, the Pope <laughs> came down on it, is in a nutshell. And what happened was most of the people were growing. There was no law. It wasn't that, can, that Switzerland legalized cannabis. It was that it never made it illegal for growing. It had made it illegal to use it as a drug and to sell it. There were no hash bars like Amsterdam. But there were fields of it along the side of the train full of white widow or white shark, you name it. It was grown wide open. And it was sold wide open in pot stores. They would have kilos stacked to the roof in the front walls of the stores. You know, it was ridiculous. And on the, the sidewalk of Chiasso, which is a town, there's Como and Chiasso. Como's in Italy and Chiasso's in Switzerland. And there's a border on the main street, basically. So the if you walked from the Italian side into the Swiss side, there were pot leaf sandwich boards all the way down the sidewalks for the first three blocks, probably. And people would walk over and buy cannabis and walk back to Italy. And the uh, they, Italians actually had to change their laws because they had, the border guys were forced to charge anybody they found with it. So they actually reduced that to, they could let anybody go with five grams or less without charging them. So that, that was their big win at the time. And, but then the people would just walk over every day and buy five grams <laughs> and they would walk back and the border guys would just roll their eyes and wave them through. Cause it wasn't, what are they going to do? Take five grams from 50,000 people every day, <laughs> just not happening. Right. So, but the, what happened was an investigative reporter from Rome, he came up and went into one of the bigger shops I won't say whose shop or whatnot, but the but they had him. He had a hidden camera and microphone, and he went in, saw all the weed, asked to see some samples. How much a kilo? Is fifteen hundred a kilo for this frosty greenhouse grown bud? You know, Dutch varieties. And he's he said, "Oh, it's such a shame that we can't get this in Rome." He says, I could make a fortune if I could get this in Rome at this price. And the and the shop owner said, hey, at this price, we offer 24-hour free delivery to Rome. So that played on the TV. And then the you know the flood of kids smoking dope on St. Peter's Square or whatever. <laughs> Pope was pissed off about the weed. And he called the prosecutor in the region, told her, if you're a good cat, Catholic, you're going to round these people up and do a big inspection, and even if you can't legally shut them down, make their lives hard, and the Pope came down on it. That's really what the higher-ups told us. My lawyer was friends with uh, with the lady, or knew her from school. They were in the same law school, and, and I had, she didn't even know about our company, but she came down on it. Because my lawyer called her because we had a problem with a thief that kept breaking in. And this thief was renowned in this neighborhood and I'd caught him and beat him up a couple times. I was like, if I catch him again, what am I going to do? Like, I just, I say, I want to stop myself to protect them. So I said, get this thief arrested. We're tax paying company. We're doing everything above board. There was literally no reason not to use them to put them away, except we didn't know. They were just lining up the ducks to do a big roundup of the industry. And when he brought us to her attention, she's like, oh, I'm glad you told me about them because we were just about to round up 99 pot companies and we'd never heard of this one. And we didn't have a sign. 
all the other ones were growing and had retail stores where they were selling the product. Not joints or hash, mind you, but just bags of crafts. Sacchetti profumate. And <laughs> so she wanted to do a roundup inspection of us. We're not doing anything illegal. We have all our stuff in order because we're a seed company and seeds are you know, unmistakably legal and they're being exported to only legal countries. The federal uh, government gave us rebates on our annual employee taxes paid and everything. Because if you were considered an export company and 70% of your production was exported, ours was 97% of our production was exported, then the Swiss government gave you huge rebates on all the taxes you paid over the years. So we were really totally above board and not hiding anything. So we were quite... Uh, quite perturbed when they wanted to do this inspection and whatnot, but we let them go ahead and they get to see a mountain of, what do you do with all the flowers after you take the seeds out of them? We compost them. Where do you compost them? In the compost pile. You take, <laughs> there's literally a mountain of bud composting with seeds sprouting out of it like a chia pet. Like it was just, okay, so that's what all that bud looks like. Yeah, so we were able to show them everything. So we didn't have any legal troubles, but I just thought, if you're going to start being a hassle, I don't need this shit, you know? So, and then I was just happy to wrap it up at that point, and we had a lot of seeds produced and stashed, too, so we we could just ride off that for a while. So we shut down the company. I actually sold the facility to Shanty Baba when I left, and I was in Spain. And then, sadly, they... Him and I had a disagreement, in a, a friendly disagreement. So I said, I'm just going to leave if they're going to be dicks about it. And he said, oh, they're just trying to scare away you cowboys, was his words exactly. But then a few months later, they picked them up and stuck them in a dungeon condemned by Amnesty International. It was like a 400-year-old Mendrizio dungeon. So I felt super bad for the guy because he's the nicest guy. I remember writing him a letter back, back in the day, but I hope I was well with him. I haven't talked to him in a dog's age. But yeah. yeah, so that was sort of how how I got uh, through it in Canada, in Switzerland, out of Switzerland, and then uh, starting up again now in the tropics. Yeah, wow, what an adventure. It's been wild. And, now, and this year is really going to be something because um, Mexico has just come around, St. Vincent, Jamaica... We've been getting invites to other parts of the world throughout Africa, even Asia, including China and Thailand. But I think I am going to focus my efforts this year predominantly between um, Colombia, Mexico, and Canada. And may do, um, I've been offered 20 acres in Jamaica and 20 acres in St. Vincent. So I'm tempted to take those up because island time is always a good time. But, uh, Mexico is such a hotbed of amazing cannabis evolution, different valleys in Mexico. I've always been intrigued by, you know, Great Oaxacan. And the first time I was ever in Mexico was when I was 16, which was a long time ago. And the first Mexican bud I ever saw that wasn't brickweed in North America, the first Mexican bud I saw in Mexico was gorgeous, frosty purple bud from a little Mayan <laughs> and I was totally <laughs> blown away. I was 16. It was like I was just starting to see Frosty Bud, you know? When I was like 14, 15, 16, you were seeing a lot more brickweed from Mexico or Jamaica is what we had uh, commonly in Canada at that time, and a lot more hash and oil because it was an import scene and those pack a little better. Um the local production wasn't really catching on yet. The people were growing Mexican or Jamaican seed and it wasn't always working out too well. So by the time people started growing modern hybrids like skunk or Northern Lights, <laughs> modern at the time, there, it was a, a real eye opener. You'd be like, whoa, this is what it's supposed to be like. Now I get it, you know? So they were like, and we and this is from here. We don't have to import this shit, you know. This is great. So we just said, time to go to town and learn how to do it. And me and my friends all got into putting a few plants out and helping each other. Maybe one of them would have a place where we could keep a light and a few mothers and start some cuts, and then we would take them out. 
So it was, uh, you know, we all drew our own, but it was still a team effort. But it was fun. And, and you know, that, that was a good time. I totally always will have fond memories of that. And the people that got pinched doing it at the time will not have such fond memories of it because if you got caught with one plant back then, you were getting jail time. And it still just turns my stomach to see the people that think we should be in a fucking cage because we have better taste in herbs than them, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I saw the repression of this, not just in, it was not obviously just in Canada. You see the whole world, how many millions of people are banged up for this bloody tasty herb. It, it just made me insane. And I always thought too, that the, the best way we could fight back was teaching our friends to grow their own and teach and telling them, teach your friends to grow their own and really get a strong culture of that going. So no matter how they, you know, shut down the borders or whatever, they want to build a wall. We've got the goods. Fuck it. It doesn't, <laughs> we don't need the, we don't need Mexican brickweed coming up here by the bale. We've got kind bud here ourselves. And that's satisfying. But I think, to this day, in, in the majority of countries of the world, the entire system, the shit system, is trying to make the plant extinct. And at that point, there wasn't a country in the world that wasn't trying to make the plant extinct. And when you think, what right does one species have to make another species extinct? That's the ultimate in hubris. You know, and I just thought, this is just unacceptable and i'm thinking not on my watch i'm going to do everything i can to preserve these plants and spread them around and i'm not going to be alone doing it but it really was the people that were committed to doing that early on that uh, there was a really good feeling between people that felt the same and you were happy to share you know and it wasn't a matter of hoarding and i can see as it becomes legal, people are going to want to maintain an advantage of having proprietary genetics and stuff. And I'll be the same too. But at the time, it was really more a matter of preservation and that we didn't want to see this get lost. And they were, think of how much government spent flying around, spraying stuff and pulling out plants with helicopters. I always thought, you know, if they can afford to fly around the country pulling plants out of cornfields and backyards and cliffs and you name it, you're thinking, what do they need our money for? They've got way too much time and money on their hands if they can fly around the fucking world ripping herbs out of our yards, you know, or the bush. Like, how much does that cost? That's insane. And when I, it really put me against government and it's never changed, you know, I've just lost you know, any shred of respect for governments when they persecute cannabis users. And I just, you know, but that's probably going to be lifelong, even when they grudgingly legalize it, but on shitty terms, I'm still not impressed, you know? So I think, well, it's still better than some places where, I mean, at least Canadians smoking a joint and, most municipalities aren't going to have a trouble, but like in Canada, it's, you know, changes in every municipality right now. So there's the feds, let the provinces do what they want. And the provinces tell the municipalities, you can kind of do as you see fit as well. So in one side of town where I am, you can't smoke in public. And the other side, you can smoke anywhere you can uh, have a cigarette. So it's not a consistent open legalization it's not a simple legal like tomatoes legalization like i'd seen in switzerland when i moved there and that was the most beautiful to see that you could grow a field of weed as many as you wanted without any regulation concerning licensing or anything like that it was the end use was the issue and as seeds was my end use and i was growing research crops that was fine i didn't have a bong bar I wasn't selling blocks of hash to, you know, their kids at school. <laughs> I was simply growing a field of weed, picking out my favorites, sampling it as I would. And, uh, I mean, I'm a real hash smoker. It takes a lot of weed to keep a real hash 
a smoker and melt. You know, it's not something you can do with four plants, which the Canadian regs currently are permitting. And in BC, you can only grow four plants if your neighbors can't see them. If your neighbors can see them, you get six months mandatory minimum or something stupid. Like it's, it's so far from a rational legalization. I mean, I know it's worse than Australia. And I think, you know, I hate to be bitching when we've got some ground covered, but it really is one of those cases where it's far from good, but I'm sure it's good from afar, you know? Yeah, I mean, having been here and maybe a little bit of exposure, you know, what do you think is the way for Australia to move forward given we've got nothing so far, really? Well, all you need is nothing. They don't need to do anything other than return it to its original state as part of our fucking planet. You know, the regulations are what destroy it. The It wasn't a problem before they regulated it. You know, the regulations are where it went downhill. So I'm a real free marketeer. I would be happy if I could pull up at the side of the road and buy untusted buds from the hippies that live there. But if... If uh, somebody else wants to walk into a pharmacy and get something that's verified organic and third party tested to be free of contaminants, I have no problem with that. Some company, maybe my own, will exist to fill that need. But I don't think it has to be because let's face it, how many of us have ever, ever had verified clean bud? It's clean because it's generally clean. And, and if it's contaminated, you can smell it. You open a bag of weed with mold in it, you don't need a test to tell you it's moldy. <laughs> you can smell that moldy weed as soon as you open the bag. You know? The there's and there's degrees of tolerance. So in Canada, CFUs, call colony forming units, the limit with Health Canada is fifty thousand CFUs per gram. Now, I don't know, and I've been asking them repeatedly for a solid year or two. What is the tolerance for CFU per gram on cigars? Because if there is a fucking discrepancy between what a Cohiba can have and what a reefer can have, we've got a problem. And the, the Canadian regs clearly favor tobacco. Health Canada's absolutely shat the bed on this one because they've made it impossible for a gram of weed to equal a gram of tobacco price-wise because they've made a flat tax of a minimum a dollar on every gram. So they don't tax tobacco that way. If they did, tobacco in Canada would be as expensive as it is in Australia. Because <laughs> holy fuck, I was surprised to see how expensive cigarettes were in Australia. Yeah, right. That's the real nanny state at play there. Yeah, but, Canada, but Canada's protecting the tobacco lobby by ensuring... Even they, it's not even a question of low THC or anything. Even if I had low THC hemp flowers, they would still tax it a dollar a gram, which makes it virtually impossible. In, in British Columbia, at least, it varies in Canada. A pack of cigarettes in, in BC is 20. In Ontario, it's 25. So it kind of varies by province how many cigarettes are in a pack. I think in Australia, they were 30 in a pack. But uh, in BC, a pack of cigarettes is in the neighborhood of... 12 to $17. So it's creeping up on, you know, it's somewhere between 50 cents and a dollar a smoke, but not quite a dollar a smoke. But that's the kit and caboodle. If it was 20 hemp cigarettes, it would be $20 excise right off the top, then the price of the product plus sales tax. So they're absolutely ensuring if I want to sell joints, for the same price as cigarettes, they've made it mathematically impossible. And there is no reason to tax cannabis, uh, you know, a treatment of cancer for more than the cause of it. You know, it's absolutely asinine. So they just, uh, the Canadian government just pisses me off endlessly, as I'm sure yours does to you. Yeah, I mean, the thing they say to us, which I'm not sure, I, I imagine the Canadian government would do the same, is that they say that they're going to tax more on tobacco. Maybe they don't do it in Canada, but in Australia, they say we're going to uh, tax tobacco harder because that's how we can still be able to offer, um, you know, universal health care because we're covering all the, the burden on the health care system of the smokers. 
It's all a tax grip. My my Australian doctor father in law explained to me <laughs> who is actually a lung doctor and dealt with nothing but people dying of smoking diseases his whole life. And he straight up told me, he said, smokers cost the system less because they die younger. It's the people that are on life support <laughs> dragging it out from 80 to 90 that have, you know, a bunch of little ailments that are in to see the doctor three times a week. Those cost the system a shitload, not the guys that die of strokes at 50, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I'd love to see the figures behind it, but yeah, I mean, the tax in Australia. Just die younger. You, you just check it out. Do the math on smokers die younger, and the elder seniors cost the system the most. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the seniors is getting old. That should be illegal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd I'd love to they make should, that one they illegal. Tax people for getting old. The older you get, the more you owe. <laughs> should be encouraged to die young for the good of society <laughs> leave a pretty body <laughs> um, something I wanted to ask about is you referenced it earlier and um, you can feel free to be a little bit ambiguous or as specific as you like but I've noticed there are a few companies there are definitely a few companies that offer like you know what looks like your work and sometimes it's a bit ambiguous as to see like is this them doing a knockoff or whatnot? And so I've got one specific I'd love to ask about is, do you have any relationship with Alpine Seeds? Because I can see they offer a whole bunch of... Never, sweet... even, heard of them. Never even heard of them. There you go. Because they offer a bunch of sweet grapefruit stuff like Femmes, BXs, stuff like that. And it looked like it was more on the legit end just due to how deep of an offering they had for sweet pink grapefruit. But I guess at this point, you're just used to it, you know, being the game like that. Yeah, let, this is an interesting point, you know, is I have been, you know, in some eyes a hothead about this over the years, but I really have a fairly, to me, simple understanding of the way this can work good for everybody. When I share or sell genetics, like a seat, let's say sweet tooth, for example, if I make a cross and I call it sweet tooth and nobody else has called their cross sweet tooth, you know, that's an original seed cross and it's original name for it. If you take those and make more seeds with them, I only ask that you give them a new name because the seeds you have won't be the same as mine, you know? So I say, I don't mind if you want to call it Dente Dulce and put in bracket, I made this F2 with Sweet Tooth or whatever, you know? But call it something else because it... It confuses people down the line. And this is what really happened a lot with Sweet Skunk, too, actually. But the uh, but Sweet Tooth is a good example. It's uh, They're all good examples. I mean, it's happened with all of them. As soon as your seed's popular, people are making knockoffs of it. That's a given. The, uh, there's, you know, it's the only seed breeding in the world that couldn't be protected with breeders' rights. So... So it was an easy thing for unscrupulous hacks to just start chucking pollen in their closet and calling it a popular name. But it, the letdown for me was that that the vendors would carry them. I would feel like, you know what, I want to stop supplying these people that are selling knockoffs of the seeds I work on. Because I promote them, I get them the exposure into the cup or whatever, and then the next week everybody's selling it as their own. And you're just like, for fuck's sake, people, have some... Have a little respect and have a little dignity and fucking give your seeds an original name because they're your seeds. I'm happy if you credit them and say where they came from. I don't really care, but if you want to, I'm happy to. That shows respect and that's cool. And I did the same thing when I was making seeds as I would always list to the the best of my knowledge, the origins, the real origins, because we were preservationists as well. We have a duty to carry things on accurately to the best of our ability, considering even record keeping was a liability. When I started growing, I didn't even like keeping pictures. I had a couple Polaroids, which I hopefully I still have, but from, <laughs> from way back when. But you didn't keep a roll of pictures of your grow rooms because when people were in court, the, the cops would say, well, here we've got photos of all this grass you've grown and that would use it against them. So you you were covering your tracks to keep no records. So it was really a verbal oral tradition. Um, so, you know, 
accuracy and as a breeder, you know, accurate labeling is everything. If you're not doing accurate labeling, it's crazy. So it just makes you don't think, I know we can't call your sweet tooth. I already called these ones sweet tooth, you know. So it's uh, not just marketing, but it's really, it makes me crazy when I see people growing Hermes sweet skunk. It wasn't my sweet skunk, but it was somebody's. Some idiot fucking would sell some sweet skunk, and then everybody would be going, ah, I like sweet skunk, but it's Hermie. It's like, no, it wasn't fucking Hermie until that moron started selling self ones, you know? So it really dilutes your work when people sell their work as yours, you know, or mistakenly close, like easily mistakenly close. But like when people were making, I think I gave Bodie Hill one line for Blockhead years ago and say, you know, and somebody made up the, they understood my point. And I said, if you called it square dome and put a blockhead back cross, you'd have no problem. I'd be fucking sending you Christmas cards. That's super cool. But if people can mistake yours for mine, then it becomes an issue down the road when people start getting stuff that's not representative of what I put out and they start blaming me for it. What are you, what are you going to think? Right? So that's, you know, neither here nor there. It, you know, an egregious example was, and still is uh, Barney's Barney's farm in Amsterdam. There was no Barney's farm when they entered Sweet Tooth in the cup. The Sweet Tooth they entered in the cup was grown by a Dutch grower who bought the seeds in Vancouver and was actually growing Sweet Tooth. I was at the same cup unloading a pile of Sweet Tooth as free samples at my seed booth. Sweet Tooth was all the rage. And the... Uh, and so the coffee shop at Barney's won the cup of sweet tooth. I was very happy for them. I knew it was our sweet tooth. Then a few months later, they come out with Barney's farm and a seed line called sweet tooth that they made up, you know, whatever heritage they used was totally unrelated. They didn't actually make it with the sweet tooth from me. They took their own, cross and just called it sweet tooth and it looked nothing like it it didn't look like the bud they entered in the cup i mean it was just painful to see this blatant name rip off you know and i just thought that's just shameless and uh later they came out with shishkaberry i see they had a new release i saw online somebody sent me a link they said here check this out barney just released a new strain called shishkaberry <laughs> That's funny because I seem to remember making that mid nineties the same crop I made the sweet tooth with with the same dad and all, but it's a new strain at Bernie's now, and there's it looks like it should be descended from Shishkaberry, but their sweet tooth doesn't even look like it's descended from sweet tooth. It's just a blatant step on the name, and the sad thing is is now there's going to be people growing out Barney's sweet tooth and thinking it's sweet tooth. Or sharing it with people, and they're going, "Hey, this is uh, sweet tooth," and they're like, eh, "This isn't very sweet." You know, what's the big deal with sweet tooth? Sweet tooth isn't all that. It's like you've never even had the real sweet tooth, you know. So it's a bit painful to see these people abusing it, and that's one thing I look forward to in legalization. Is I haven't released anything new since like 2003, and I've been working on things for the last few years, and I'm really excited to bring them out. But I'm not going to mention the name of them until I can sue people's asses for fucking knocking them off, you know? So that's it. It's a, And that gives more viability to the business of setting up R&D centers for seed. You know, if, if you're out there going to the ends of the world to plant fields and you know, do it where you can legally and whatnot. It, does, it means leaving your comfort zone sometimes, and it's called work. But when uh, people that are in their bloody apartments making knockoffs in their closet, and then they just can't end up at the same retailer. I just didn't want it. I won't deal with the, the retailers that have a bad um, history of selling knockoffs. I just pissed me off too much and I would really like to come back out with seeds once I can sell them direct and cut out the middleman and bring really good quality, good value seeds directly to people. But it still would be, you know, another division. And at this point, a, I'm not ready to release them. 
and B, I'm just going to decide closer to the time because I would like to have direct retail and know that they're not getting a switch and bait and switch practice. Like even at many of these other resellers, they might keep stuff up that looks like it's available when it's sold out. I mean, there's people pretending to be selling seeds they bought from me 15 years ago for 15 years. I know they don't still have those seeds, but they're saying they do because when you send them money to order them, they're going to send you a replacement, you know, and say, oh, actually, we're out of that. Not, not, well, we've been out of that for 14 years <laughs> and it's still on the menu, you know, like there's just so many grease balls <laughs> in the business that. I was like, I just can't do it like this. I got to wait until I can do it openly and legally again because there's just so many greasy people to deal with. And the sad thing is now that it's legal again and they got all these stock pimps and whatnot, <laughs> it's almost greasier now. I think in a lot of ways it's actually gone downhill. I've, I've seen the caliber of people involved in the alleged cannabis trade. They may just be involved in the paper trade, but they consider it the cannabis trade because they're not actually qualified to do anything in the cannabis trade. So these bloody paper pushers are really greasing up the scene. And it's, it's at the point where, you know, you don't even want to go to a cannabis convention in Canada because of the greasy low life industry players these days. And it, like of the first 15 companies, there's over 13 of them hired a lobby group to press for the arrests of bud tenders and dispensaries because people were exercising their power of choice and deciding that the pot from the local unlicensed dispensary was several magnitudes of quality better than what they were ordering online from these licensed corporations and those and not all but most of those corporations lobbied for their arrests and i'm a very pro-choice free market person if people think they're getting a better product from somebody I go nuts buy it from them and if they think your product sucks they shouldn't be a captive market for your shareholders you know and if you have to cage your competition to succeed, you're a piece of shit. And that's those same companies, most of them, lobbied against field-grown pot, outdoor. They lobbied um, against homegrown even because they really wanted you to have to buy their $17 grams of over-dried flavorless bud. And most Canadians that have sampled weed from the legal producers – They've found, I would say, no more than five that anyone likes the weed from. The rest of them, people just constantly complain, and it's a dance because they're only allowed to belong to two LPs at a time. The patients belong to the LPs, so they have to put their script with two LPs, and that was an increase from one. So they have, they're at the mercy, and most of those LPs were really get into the business wanting to serve the rec market, and the med market was just an excuse for a little while. And they have left their patients hanging as they put the weed out to the rec market, and the, the government was ultimately failed in its uh, attempt to create a legal industry in a timely manner. They wanted to protect the kids and get rid of the black market and make sure that the supply was safe and tested and all these noble pursuits. But what's happened is, you know, the organized crime is the government. <laughs> and it is a lot of the kleptocracy we live in with the corporations joined at the hip with regulatory capture with what's happening there. So, you know, those guys were lobbying against outdoor growing because they knew it would make their, their flowering facilities into white elephants. And it, that's just not the way business is steering government. We've got a problem and, and it's, you know, ready to cage us rather than concede losses to a better competitor, which was the black market was kicking their, their ass all over the place. So, you know, and the legal market also failed to come out with edibles and extracts at the same time as grass. And I understand there was maybe some strategy politically behind that in that they didn't want to lose getting grass through 
on the first wave because those in opposition were absolutely adamant against shatter and edibles, right? The children, the children. And uh, so I, I do believe there was some strategy probably, but they, in all the states that legalized it, they did it all at once, you know? So it was a little disappointing to see that uh, lack of follow through here. Um, yeah. The other point, I did, I swear I had another point <laughs> on the, um, no, I'm enjoying it all. One thing I wanted to just quickly ask, though, because it was just, you mentioned it a minute ago. If you did, you know, get that direct to customer or even if it went through a trusted middleman, however you end up doing it, would that mean a return for Spice of Life seeds or would it be under a different banner? Yeah, that's a good question. And it might even be a couple of brands. You know, it's a possibility. There's a good, you know, of course, it would be fun to bring back Spice, but... Um, Sometimes a new project needs a new name too, you know, so I'm uh, open to doing both even. I'm just not going to say it because I'm a, way, a little ways away from that. Another thing that I'm actually considering that y you just brought up is Spice of Life Verified Genetics. So I was going to offer a three-level program essentially for producers for me to verify that they're growing what they say they are, B, that it's an approved quality that I think these guys are doing a pretty good job of this. And the third level being Spice of Life brand or their breeder Steve Buds or however we want to dress it up and say these these guys are doing exceptionally well. I would be happy to call it my own. It's fucking good. You know, so if I the people I meet that I believe can do that, I'm offering them a chance. The producers um, that I think can do the same quality of grass consistently that I would totally respect and I say I would supply you with genetics forever I'll just keep sending you new stuff as I want to release it and there's no upfront costs but I would like residual 10 cents a gram on the production of breeder Steve brands let's say and I would have consistent packaging for them to get so that it was exactly the same from Anchorage to Auckland, you know, and anywhere in the world, if you bought Breeder Steve brand buds, you knew it came in this package with this security feature, you know, and really have a, and then have an annual party where the licensed spice growers can get together. You can swap seeds. We can have a, Lots of fun, but I'll, I'll, we'll have definitely have an annual party for a get together, and I'll encourage this sort of network of spice growers to share amongst themselves, because if it's so nice when you have favorite flavors that you know you can reliably find a good version of it consistently wherever you go. That just doesn't happen in cannabis yet, you know. So I think that would be, you know, something to achieve if we could do it. So that's been on my mind more and more recently because um, there's a new window for introducing genetics into the Canadian legal system right now. It used to be that they original, originally there was a window where they could bring in no questions asked genetics for the first X amount of LPs. After a certain date, they closed that down and they could only buy and sell what they'd had brought into the system between each other. So they were all selling each other clones for gouging rates usually. <laughs> like 50, you know, here, give me 15 grand for um, the genetic and then $17 a clone for the 10,000 clones you need. And uh, don't give them to anybody else in the big contract. It was all just, okay. Um, but then they're all growing the same thing. Like literally every single LP in Canada grows shishkaberry. But the sad thing is, it's a pretty pathetic selection they've got, I think. Like, I haven't seen any of the LPs do, do a really nice job with it. I've seen it growing out, like, frosty and full. And I think, I don't know, it's just not... There's a, another shishkaberry clone going around the black market in BC making fruity, gorgeous, fat, frosty nugs. It's, it's twice as nice a cutting as the one in the legal system, so that's kind of too bad. But at least there's uh, room to bring that other one into the legal system because under the new Cannabis Act, uh, new growers and new licensees are allowed to bring in um, genetics from wherever they want one time. So they have to declare them all 
at their opening of their license. You know, okay, here's what I have. And they have to provide evidence that they have, you know, if they've got this, these hundred clones and these hundred seeds or whatever. So there's going to be a, because fr- they realize they need a fresh influx into this very closed loop system. When they they don't understand the importance of of genetic diversity, that's a understatement. But uh, the point I was trying to make earlier when I was pitching about the how they could have done that licensing a little better, where they failed on the rollout, I just remembered, was they've spent over 20 years licensing growers to grow without ever licensing them to sell. So all they would have had to do was say, and every single one of those growers wants to go legal, but they don't want to have to open a public company to do it, to meet a bunch of asinine expenses. And uh, just let those growers submit pot for third-party verification, if you must, and call that licensed. You know, hey, you pass the batch cleanliness test, you're in. You get to pay taxes. And they would all jump at the possibility. So while the Canadian media frets about the Canadian, great Canadian pot shortage, pot has never been more available or less expensive in this country than it is right now. You would be astounded, man. You can get pounds of bud you would like for under a thousand bucks, like 600 bucks, 400 bucks. What? You know, yeah, it's so cheap here now. It's so cheap. And the people that have are absolutely, let's call them gormless, they, <laughs> they would still walk into a dispensary and pay $15 because they don't know anybody that even grows pot or haven't tried to themselves. But if you have a bunch of friends that are growers, the going price, if you have any friends that are growers, you're literally going to be able to get nice pot these days for so cheap. Whereas they go into the dispensary or go online to order it from the Ontario cannabis store or something, and they're paying, like, there's plenty of cannabis in the 15 to $17 a gram range, and I think there was some that was even higher. And I'm not opposed to there being luxury items and charging a high price for stuff. That's fine. But it shouldn't, they shouldn't, uh, you know, there's no ceiling on price, but they put a, on upwards price, but they put a ceiling on downwards price, you know? So you can't go through the floor and make something actually really cheap. Like if I could sell a pack of pre-rolled joints that were a gram each, same as a pack of cigarettes, for $5 less than a pack of cigarettes, or even a dollar less than a pack of cigarettes, all in, tell me that wouldn't be appealing to many smokers who are very price conscious. They would say, Boy, oh boy, I can smoke that nice organic grass <laughs> cheaper than I can smoke cigarettes. Would that encourage people to smoke more nice organic grass rather than cigarettes? I think it would. Call me crazy, but I think people are pretty <laughs> sensitive. It, and if they're given the option to enjoy bud, and I know there's no reason we can't grow fat, frosty, full ripe buds and have them like cobs of corn. And there should be no reason you couldn't drive down the highway, pull over at the side of the road and talk to the farmer and pick out a pick out buds from all the different bins you like, you know, or hanging up hanging up there. But they can be like cobs of corn. It doesn't have to be expensive. You can have twelve big one ounce cobs for two bucks. As long as you can grow it in the wide open like that. Yeah. I was doing the math on doing an outdoor in Canada. Um, and in southwestern Ontario only because BC can't grow good outdoor bud. It can grow good outdoor bud in some places, but it can't grow great outdoor bud. The only place in Canada that you can grow great outdoor bud is in southwestern Ontario, and it's the same latitude as northern Cal and southern Oregon, 42 degrees. Um, the, the reason that makes a big difference, and people you know, would know in almost any agriculture, whether it was grapes or cherries or peaches, the harvest starts down south and the harvest moves north. So they harvest their wine in California in August and in BC maybe in October, you know, Oregon and Washington in between. So the, the harvest creeps north. 
Now, part of the reason for this, it's the same with grass, is that grass, most grass, or not all, but you know, there's exceptions to every rule, but most of the stuff we grow these days is photosensitive varieties. So it stays in veg when the days are long. It's triggered to flower when the days are short. Hence, 18 and 12 typically inside and 12, 12 for flowering, you know. And the thing is, in the northern latitudes or the higher latitudes, because for your case, they'd be southern latitudes, but the higher latitudes have such a long day in the middle of the summer that it seems to take the plant longer to snap out of veg and go into flowering. So say where I live here is like you get days that are 18 and a half hours of daylight, whereas 10 degrees further south, like in southern Ontario, they might only get 16 days, hours of daylight in the longest days. So those plants that have never got to 18 and a half hours, they only got to 16 hours. It's less of a leap for them to go into flower. So in BC, 10 degrees further north, I find the same plants going into flower slower. So by the time they do, the light is getting weaker much and much quickly. You know, the light is getting weaker every week. So the buds that are finishing under that weak light don't look as good. They may be a little leafier and not as full. Whereas in southern Ontario, I would pick the same plant four weeks earlier and it would be way riper. You know, so it's really something to see the difference between those two zones. And I think once more people realize the quality, people out west have no clue. And when people do realize the difference in quality, I think uh, you're going to see indoor places going out of business in three to five years. It's really just how lo however long it takes them to license enough outdoor back in southwestern Ontario. If they never license enough, the indoors will still be in business. But if they license enough, the indoors will be over. Because they, we could have full melt dry sift for the price of flour, you know, versus growing flowers indoors. You know, this is silly. We don't grow coffee in Canada in greenhouses. We buy it from where coffee grows well. We don't, same with sugar. You know, we do great maple syrup, but we don't try and do cane sugar up here. So there's there's cannabis that works here, and it's, and most of that is really just going to work best in southwestern Ontario. So with the outdoor market, my plan, as I come back in the circle, is to release $10 ounces untrimmed <laughs> before tax and just tops. So all the smaller buds would go for extract. And then just the tops from the end of the very top and then the tops of the top ring of branches, those tops at $10 an ounce, that's cheaper than what most LPs seem to be selling grams for <laughs> these days. They're very in the neighborhood. You know, I don't know the actual stats on what LPs are selling grams for because I don't buy grams and I don't buy from LPs. So <laughs> I'm not saying I wouldn't try a few. There's, I would say two of them whose pot look worth trying. But uh, And there were some positive reviews. And then there was another three where I'd see some positive reviews, but they didn't look all that good. And I just thought they probably just have lower standards than I do. But I'm not saying they're all bad, because it looks like there's a couple of decent ones. And that I'll give them that. The, uh, but the outdoor will make them all irrelevant, because the outdoor can grow back there is as good or better than any indoor as long as it's done well, you can still screw it up outside. I'm not saying everybody's outdoor in Ontario is better than all indoor. That's not what I'm saying. But if you know what you're doing, you can grow better bud outdoors there than you can indoors. And in a good year, too, you could have a crap year. But, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. But for my money, I'm backing outdoor southwestern Ontario for both flowers and extracts. And I totally think... I can do it at such a fraction of the cost. And by the math I did a few years ago, and I can't remember exactly how I came to the number, but I had estimated that the country consumes five to 6,000 acres worth considering flower extract edibles. You know, all, all sectors that five or 6,000 acres would saturate the market in Canada. And it's... <laughs> yeah. It's a lot less than uh, 
some people think, but that's a lot. 5,000 acres of grass. That's a lot. lot. (laughs) And, you know, with the Columbia Project, I'm looking at going a lot more than that. I'm starting out with less than that, of course, but once I've acclimatized the things I want to work with for the ends I want to achieve, I was really, my plan is to get it up and I will leave it alone once I can get it planting, harvesting, and processing two square kilometers a day. That's my goal for the equatorial project because I want to come out with vitamin THC and vitamin CBD and vitamin CBN and have these things made so inexpensively that people stop looking at them as, you know, a rare drug for the rich and just start looking at it as a necessity for everyday people in all walks of life at any price point. I want, I want to make it as ubiquitous as, you know, aspirin so that you see you can get a reliable, your aspirin is aspirin, whether you get it in Sydney or Stockholm, it looks the same, it tastes the same, it is the same, right? And it's, and it's affordable. The poor people, they don't say, uh, some days they might, but overall, many people can afford aspirin. And I don't think you should have to be rich to deserve aspirin. You know, <laughs> that's just, it shouldn't be for the top 10% of the wealthy world. It should be for everybody. And and cannabis always has been from the beginning of time. It's been the poor man's herb. It's been the herb of kings as well. And the kings maybe got the dragon's tears pressed from the edges of their hashish, but they and the poor people might be boiling stalks of low-grade plants, but it's been there for everybody. And in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, you name it, cannabis has been there for human history for so bloody long. And the absolute gall of politicians that feel they have a right to to persecute us for its use when it's one of the basic human foods you know it's it's everything it's you know i don't have to tell you people if you're listening to this show you're into pot i know that (laughs) and if you've listened this long you might be as crazy as me (laughs) well one thing i wanted to quickly ask is uh, you've made it pretty obvious that you're into growing organically but i wanted to ask what is your opinion on hydroponic and salt grown weed in general do you think it can ever compare you know what I've I've certainly done it all and and my best hydro I did uh, you know totally enjoy it and I'd leech the hell of it but it was using really clean pure nutrients too the most of the bottled newts that come with coloring and all that I generally find that uh, there's even with like two weeks of people flushing them in that I still find they maybe by the end of the joint or halfway they start to get this plasticky smell almost there's just something I don't like about it the whereas and I'm not saying all, all organic grass is done well either because it can be overfed organic and not burned too you know there's it's not a guarantee of quality that it's organic but I never find the most exciting weed not to be organic let's put it that way and i think you can grow fantastic hydro with with if especially if you're mixing your own salts and whatnot and you're really cognizant of leaching them for a totally sweet fade that they are burning really smooth and you get a true varietal flavor of each variety you're growing because there's no terroir and that's fine if you want that pure varietal flavor. Water is a great way to go. I like it with the aquaponics because I find it it's still that clean, but a little bit more life to it seems to bring out more flavor and, and more layers, even uh, more subtleties. It's the je ne sais quoi of the flavor. The there was a study a long time ago I remember reading in Tom Alexander's Growing Edge. He was the guy that published Sensimilia Tips until he got busted. And Sensimilia Tips really put me on the organic path for my second, the second time I ever grew pot. First time I grew pot, I read a book like a Grower's Guide or something. And then by that winter, before the next spring, I'd, I'd found – Sensimilia tips in like used magazines at the head store somewhere and buy them all. And you'd read all these great blends from these old Oregon hippies and that and be like, 
oh, I got to up my game, man. I could be adding a lot more organic components to the soil. And what it came to mean to me was that if I fed one or two things to the plant, it was very apparent in the smell and taste of the grass. If I used a little bit of a lot of things, none of them dominated the smell or taste of the plant. Now, case in point, the plant is what it eats. It sucks up what it eats. And some people will be skeptical of that, and that, that's fine. My experience is it's fucking obvious if your nose works. Because I, I had a friend, well, a guy I was just meeting at the time, actually, been, we were friends for a long time since, but he came into my apartment and to uh, show me a half pound of weed. And he was a friend of a friend. And he came in, and before he even pulled the bag out of his backpack, I said, do you grow with fish? <laughs> and he said, what? I said, or fish? I said, do you use fish emulsion? Because one of my friends at home was growing with straight fish emulsion and his weed smelled like the shitty ass bottle of fish emulsion. It totally came through in the smell <laughs> of the weed when you smoked it. And so I asked this guy, because it just smelled like my buddy's weed because I could smell weed when he came in, but I could smell weed with fish <laughs> and not live fish, but dead fish. And I said this to him right as he was reaching in his bag to pull out the half pound, he's pulling out the half pound and his eyes go wide. He says, and he goes kind of white. And he's like, why did you say that? And I said, I got a friend that grows with fish emulsion. His weed smells just like yours. And he says, I put a fish in every hole, you know, <laughs> He was just, he was just, he's like, nobody ever, people just suddenly go, wow, that's beautiful. That's great grass. He was, you're the only person that ever said your weed's fishy, you know, and he <laughs> couldn't believe it. So we had, because, you know, it was just an honest remark. It wasn't, wasn't trying to be a dick. I was just being honest about it, you know, and, uh, but it's so funny the, the way the plant really carries whatever. It's like when you stick celery and red dye and your celery will turn red. You think of the grass the same way, is it will pick up, you know, it's built out of what's underneath it, right? It's not just built out of thin air. So the, another time, the, from the first year I grew, I had a plant that I used um, a bag with steer manure. And that steer manure wasn't composted that long. And later that, that winter when I was reading about how well composted it had to be and it couldn't smell still and it should break up really soft and it shouldn't be wet and sticky and smell. And I thought all oh, the shit I used was wet and sticky and smelled. But I didn't even think about it until a non-smoker um, at my girlfriend's house, she had roommates, a non-smoker came into the room and said, what is with that weed you're smoking? It smells like manure. And they were dead serious and they were pissed. And I thought it was funny because I was baked. I just laughed. But I went and had a shower or the next morning or something. I had a shower. And when I walked back into the room, it hit me because I just smoked a joint in there. And my, once I had a shower and cleaned out, walked back in the room, he's right. It totally smells like manure. <laughs> and I realized that was because that wasn't composted well enough, that manure. So then I got really adamant about finding the oldest compost I could find and really becoming a bit of a compost snob. And that made oh, yeah. that next year, that pot that I grew the second year, having done my homework after that first year, it was so good. I measure everything I see to this day against it, you know, and it was just so fucking good. And it was one of the things in it, I have about 17 things mixed in the hole, but one of them was the uh, generous helpings of hundred year old chicken compost from a chicken shed that just got tore down and had been exposed to the, it was just like ground soft sand almost. It was really weird. It had no smell. It was kind of spongy. And they'd hundred years. They'd had a chicken coop there. They hadn't had chickens in it for about 10 years and tore it down and it just been rained on and for a couple of years. And it was so good. They were really, really exceptional buds that I'll never, ever forget. The year before, the first year I ever grew, I, I had uh, already done a bit more homework than my friends locally. And one of them, his parents were okay. They lived in the country, and they said, you can start some here. Let's take them away to plant. So he said, okay. 
So I had a Sucrets tin with 2,000 seeds from Jamaican weed I used to get in cans from Montreal from Jamaican guys there. And I had those 2,000 seeds, and I, I went and planted them in trays, and we transplanted them into little four-inch pots, and we left them like that. And then after, once the time they were kind of 2,000 knee highs, then his mom started going, that's a lot of little plants. I want you to start getting those out of here. And so the one day I popped over to go grab one because they were just starting to sex, and there was one that was really starting to show like a little cluster of pistols on top, and it was just the furthest ahead of anything in the female department. And I, I just said, I'm just going to take one. You guys can have the rest of them. And I took that one plant and dug a hole and planted it at the creek near my house. And that was the first plant I ever grew. And that was from Jamaican. And it was the only one of 2,000 seeds probably that even finished. <laughs> and the rest of them probably wouldn't finish in Canada. But that one just happened to be a real early one, a relatively early one. And I never smelled or tasted it again until a couple of years ago when I first went to Columbia. And the, the, I visited some plants in a friend's place near Bogota and greenhouses. But the very the, then I flew to uh, Rizaralda, um it's another department, and that's a area that's known for Punta Rojo. So I thought, oh, I'm going to see some Punta Rojo visiting farms in the hills here. And the first farm we showed up at, I saw this plant across the yard. It was a little shorter than the one I had, but it's always 12 hours there. And I knew it was the same plant from a, from across the yard before I could even smell it. I said, oh, my God, that looks like the it's the same structure, that first plant I ever grew, and same coloring in that. And I got closer. And it totally was, and I could rub it and smell it, and they're just like full circle, you know. I never smelled that. I got whiffs of it in things, but I never smelled that plant again until I went to Columbia, and it totally closed the circle for me because it was like, holy shit, that's the first bud I ever grew is Punta Rojo. And, of course, lots of Colombian seed ended up going through Jamaica. So there's no doubt in my mind that that first, Colombian stuff I had. It may not have been pure Punta Rojo. It may have been a, mixed with other Colombian things or Jamaican things, but it may not have been. It could have been pure Punta Rojo, but it really, that one expression at least, it blew my mind. So it was really fun to to see that. And, and again, as you get older, it's not always about, you know, it's, you only want the latest and greatest. You get nostalgic for flavors you miss, you know? And hey, it's not the strongest one. Punta it doesn't it doesn't put the hurt on anybody. It's just a nice light social smoke, light buzz, but very pleasant tasting. And definitely, you know, you get stoned from it. <laughs> you just maybe don't get as stoned from it as you might from something else that's 30% THC. But then again, it's a question of degree because me with that 30% THC, people are smoking pinners of. And... Uh, not the same bats are smoking that other one. Either six of one, half a dozen of the other. You're still high. Everybody's happy. Yeah, for sure. It's it's hard to compare, right? I just want to quickly jump back though to the Genesis story behind Sweet Tooth because I remember when we were able to hang out, you told me it, and I was like, man, that's such a cool story. I need to get you to tell that one again. Specifically, the the blueberry mail you were using. The mail, yeah. So the so. Of the 1,500 plants I had in my backyard that summer, and I am going to say that was 1996, and it's a bit fuzzy back then, but I do believe it was 1996 that summer that I did this big selection in the backyard. And of this uh, DJ Short blueberry seed that uh, Mark Emery had given me, I think I had five seeds or six seeds or something, and the females were no great shakes. I never even kept one. But the the uh, male, there was one male that had a hard purple top. It looked like a cluster of dark grapes pointing up, really tight balls. But the amazing thing about it was it had chromatic resin is they shone like all bearings with a metallic chromatic look to them. They weren't clear, white, amber, cloudy. They were ball bearings. They were just shiny metal balls. 
and I'd never seen that before, and I don't think I've seen it since, to see that real, real metal sheen on those trikes. And so that plant, and and visually it was stunning with the green leaves, dark purple flowers, metallic resin glistening all over. I'd never seen that resin on a male either. And when you squeezed it, you know, it reeked of blueberry jam. It smelled so good of blueberry jam. And I had one of my three grow rooms in my basement set up that I wanted to seed. So I was just going to take the best mail from the backyard that summer and go down and pollinate those. And that's the one I chose. And that the top bud of that plant, I actually dried with my coffee cups in the kitchen. And then I smoked it in little bits in my bong because it was delicious. It was like licking blueberry pie filling with every bong hit. It was the most delicious mail. I don't think I've even smoked other males. That mail, it was like, <laughs> I'm smoking the top of it. And I left the side branches to take, took it to the room in the basement that had plants four weeks in or something. That were, uh, and that mail went off a week or two later and, and pollinated that room. So the, that mail was responsible for fathering sweet tooth, shishkaberry, blue domino, plum bud. There was a fifth one, but I can't remember. <laughs> Those four for sure. And uh, But sadly, I didn't rejuvenate the mail and keep it because I was really thinking of it at the time more as a backboard because the other ones I wanted to um, – preserve those plants and make back cross to the, to the mothers to really try and stabilize a plant representative of grapefruit, for example, you know, and every, I would try it with a different outcross before I did the back cross to see which ones I could get to making basically a pure, Sweet and grapefruit, and essentially that was sweet two three. That was a cubed version of it. So once you back cross it, twice you square it, the third time you've cubed it. And assuming the mother you're working with to begin with is somewhat stable, by the time you've cubed it, you've got a pretty good representation of it. It's not exactly the same, but it's uh, going to fool most people, even myself sometimes, I'm sure. I would find... Uh, Sweet tooth trees that would be absolute ringers for grapefruit, but most of them were pretty much, pretty much like grapefruit. And any recessives you got were obvious because of the blue, you know. So it was a fun one to do that with. Um, and I remember the first time I met Dave Watson, he came up to me at the cup and he asked me. He said, "You bred sweet two three to be homozygous." He says, "I lurk on overgrowing cannabis world those boards." He says, I see what's going on, but I don't post or talk to anybody. But he says, I've been watching, and I see that you made a, a homozygous strain. And until that one, the only other homozygous strain was skunk number one. He says, why did you do it? And I said, everybody's got a plant that they want to get reliable seeds from, but they can't because they've only got this mother. So I want to give them a reliable backboard that they can make a cross with and then weed out of the current, the following generations, you know, because they can see, okay, this one looks like my, you know, Mullumbimbi, not like Sweet Tooth. So I'm going to take, keep taking the ones that look like the Mullumbimbi. And after a couple generations, they'll have weeded the Sweet Tooth out if they want, you know, but they'll have reliable seeds of their Mullumbimbi, relatively speaking, right? So yeah. I just wanted to put something out stable. Of course, it's easy to knock off stable seeds. They're stable, but in, that's why most seed companies of all stripes, whether they do corn or tomatoes or grass, don't release stable seeds because A, they're a lot of work, and B, by the time you get there, anybody can copy them. But for me, it was like I wanted to put that into the commons and have people able to use it, you know, to do their original work with, you know? Yeah. So it wasn't, you know, so when I see people that are, just making knockoffs of it. I'm like, you're missing the point. You know, this is useful genetics for you to do more than just knockoffs with, you know? So 
I think a lot of people would realize that, you know, the this was segueing into kind of like how you had that joint experience with DJ Short, most notably producing the Blue Satellite, which has gone on to have a huge cult following. What was your recollection of that experience? Oh, that was really fun, guys. So actually, the first blueberry I ever grew out was that male. And while it was in flower, DJ was visiting Vancouver and came over to my house and actually... Uh, was able to see it in person, and he was like, "Oh, you got a sweet one there." And of course, he looked a little, uh, little put out, like I was banging his daughter or something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but he was okay with it, you know. He was a, uh, he was okay with it. It was fun, and, and uh, there was some mutual respect there. I'm not just going to make blueberry knockoffs. That's not what I'm trying to do here, right? So, and he could appreciate what I was doing, and and uh, we both, you know, felt the same way and I've seen this with other breeders is that you say why did you get into breeding cannabis you think we just want to make it easier for everybody to grow really good stuff because we all believe that there's a conscious evolution waiting to happen in humanity and it's just a question of getting enough tasty joints into enough hands that people that you know that wouldn't normally uh, break out of the mold might be tempted to by something that just smells incredible or tastes incredible and it shatters their their preconceived notions of the world around us. But uh, so what happened was, even we both believed in this potential evolution of consciousness through better cannabis for the masses. And when I got over to Switzerland and got set up, and I was doing it over there, uh, he got in touch with me and said hey, I really love what you're doing. I'd like to come for a visit and discuss some some business, making a deal. I said, sure, come on over. So him and his darling wife came over and stayed at my place for a bit and had a look what we are doing and said he brought a contract with me for me to sign and said he um, that we should do some releases together for him to get royalties off of. It was awesome. So I said, hey, that's awesome. I'm honored honored that you're happy to do that with me, you know. So he sent me over or brought with him at the time. I can't remember. But he got a, bu- a number of seeds into my hand, including this unreleased blueberry sativa line. Um, the only one he'd released was his blueberry indica line. So the, the blueberry sativa was really interesting one. It had the squiggly leaves that we think of as TMV, as lots of blueberry does. Um, whether it's TMV or not, who knows? But the but there was that one, and there so there was the blueberry sativa. There was the moonshine or blue moonshine. Um, an old flow, and maybe a blue velvet. I but it might have just been the moonshine, the blueberry sativa, and the old flow. And those were kind of his main three old work lines of seed that was old and not getting any better and needed to be grown out to do stuff with. So he, I said, okay, let me check them out. And I grew them out. And of the flow, there was the most diversity in the flow. But my very favorites weren't the ones with the nice yielding buds, but they were this one with little popcorn nugs. And it really totally smelled like chocolatey Nepalese hash. It totally had that Nepalese hash aroma to it. And the nugs were no bigger than popcorn. There was no top bud to speak of. The top bud you could see, if you look straight down on it, you'd see a couple of calyxes and a cluster of leaves curling upwards like a rose. And from the side, the bottom of those leaves were all mauve and the insides would be dark green, but it really looked like a rose and it smelled like chocolatey hash. And I called it rosebud. And I hit it with a sweet, the same male as sweet two, three, if I believe uh, BX two P one, the, that rosebud was my favorite flavor of any, I called that, uh, that stuff we did together. I named it the joint project. So I said, okay, we'll do the joint project. And I thought, well, I'll do that with DJ. Maybe I'll do that with some other breeders and sell them under my joint project um, line. 
So the blueberry sativa, only two of them popped, and they were both females. So there was no male to use again, <laughs> unfortunately. It would have been nice and because we could have kept something going with that. But I used those two females, um, both in a room with sweet tooth three pollinations and in a room with shishkaberry three pollination and made uh, blue satellite one and two is how, how it started out. And then there were subsequent generations of each of those, but not very long and, and relatively small amounts. So it never did a really big production of those seeds. So they were always just a small section of an indoor room, but never a whole greenhouse. Like Sweet two, three, I made in a whole greenhouse. The same with Louis, you know, Legends Ultimate Indica, um, and some Blockhead. I made some seeds in really large amounts. Once I knew these crosses work out really well, we should make a shitload, you know? <laughs> so then I would do literally like 100 kilos of seed or something of, of a, a line if I really liked it. And then if I was still just in the early stages of it, I consider it dating kind of it's like not going to marry her just yet, but we're going to go out again. <laughs> so you make a cross with them and uh, I would spread them around the spice testers and that too and see, see what the, what happened. But the blue satellites were well received and they were, you know, not everybody loved them. And there was a lot of variation in, in all DJ stuff. You know, and he, he'd tell you himself is there's lots of variation. There's, he never worked. He's the absolute opposite of Dave with skunk number one. His skunk number one was bred to be homozygous. The blueberry was made to maintain populations. So it was always a population seeding that he'd been doing and never trying to dial it into one pheno. So that's like when you, you know, two blue satellites were quite comparable. One was a little bit sturdier and uh, nicer than the other one. But the flow there was really quite a few distinct phenos. It was uh, like looking at an adventure mix almost, <laughs> which was always popular. To me, that rosebud stole the show. And the, the moonshine was neat. We did the same cross with the moonshine with the Sweet Tooth BX2P1, and that was moonshine rocket fuel. So moonshine rocket fuel was out for a little while too, but again, it was kind of a one-hit wonder. I think it got bought up by like one of our customers. So it was maybe only available through heaven stairway or one of the retailers. So it wasn't widely represented like Shishkaberry three or sweet two, three. Those ones got to every country. They were selling seeds in large volumes. So, I mean, there was so much Shishkaberry in Spain. You still see Shishkaberry in Spain. <laughs> You know, in places, it was funny, I had, uh, when I had the blue domino in that first crop, I had a customer in Ottawa that uh, really liked it early and sort of was one of the first to grow out the floor and said, oh, I really like this blue domino. So he bought the rest of it. And I never made another big batch of blue domino. It was just that first F1. And... He bought the whole, I might have made an F2, but he bought the whole batch of whatever Domino, Blue Domino was out. So it was only available from this store in Ottawa. So people in other parts didn't know it at all. But if I went to Ottawa, I'd see like 20 different growers with it. it just blow my mind to see how regionalized some of those strains were just because they weren't released widely. So it would have been yeah. interesting if there was more of it to see what if it stood the test of time. But it may have stood the test of time around Ottawa, but nobody in Vancouver's growing any blue domino, I'm sure, because it was all sold in Ontario. Yeah, well, something along that note which has been of interest to me is I've always wondered what was the land race, or maybe not land race, but the Afghani that you used that went into Shishkaberry like? And because I think I read somewhere that you actually line worked it for a bit, or is that not true? Yes, it did. It was actually the only um, line, the only seed lines that I released with two mothers. So I would usually, well, every other one I did was one mother and one female, you know? Whereas with the Shishkaberry, I had two workhorse Afghans, one probably an Afghan hybrid, but 
very much on the Afghan side. But you see different Afghans. Some have a little more slender leaves. Some have the real webby ones. And then there's some that are just kind of thick medium. Most of them are kind of the thick medium. Um, they tend to be thicker leaves and thicker plants. And the leaves are even thicker. They're not a thin leaf. They're a thick leaf like cardboard. But they're chunky plants. They form the basis of all indoor growing genetics. And they add yield to anything that they're crossed with typically. So Afghanis are, you know, they are to indoor what white is to rice. You know, it's like the uh, there is a red line and yellow line. The red line had red petioles on the leaves. It was a little more rounded top and chunkier bud, but a little stouter. And the yellow line was quick to yellow as it got, it went into fade faster. So it got very yellow as it was getting ripe and it was pointier and it was a little taller and frostier, but still had that real raw mulching leaf Afghan aroma. And both the red and yellow were fantastic hash producers. So for, I was really into screening hash. When you grow seed crops, you get a lot of hash. As I, the one thing about growing a seed production crop that I love is I get to smoke every resin gland I grow and still have a commercial crop without selling a single resin gland. You know, <laughs> so I get spoiled with hash and uh, collecting it over time. I know some people think hash from seeded plants isn't as good. I know other people that think it's better. So it's personal preference. I don't think it really matters. Anybody, nobody complained that hit that melty bubble. But the, uh, <laughs> But the, those plants have really large resin glands and crossing them both at the same time with that blueberry, you know, in a good chunk, chunky rows of it, if I had maybe five types of weed or six types of weed in that room for that pollination. So, so there was a substantial amount of it um, on that F1 at least. And then it was only more after that. They, they were so popular, the... Uh, the blueberry really elevated it. So you were still getting a big, fat, chunky, frosty bud, but you would get some more fruit in it and some more color. Like instead of just being all the same olive green color, it would have streaks of purple. And instead of just smelling like mulching leaves, it smelled like a little soubois perhaps, but very much fruity. You know, so it was totally elevated it and still was a good commercial option. And the thing that any seed producer, unless times have changed, but back then most growers really only interested in commercial seed. The guys that were growing for their head, were they were still out there, but they were in the minority. So I prefer to breed stuff that tasted fantastic or had a nice uplifting kick. But most people were really concerned about yield and time. And it's and bag appeal because they're commercial growers. So any seed company at the time realized that the market was for commercial seed and shishkaberry every year would probably be 80% of the sales because it was the top yielding plant and people want the big heavy thing, you know, and it, to me, it was not my favorite flavor of grass but it was one of my favorites for making hash. <coughs> it would yield maybe three times the hash of the same amount of sweet tooth trim. Wow. It, and the glands would stack up in higher screens. Like you have a, one, a 220 work bag, and then you got your 190 and 160 and everything underneath it. The 190 would melt. It would bubble, big, shiny bubbles. Like it was the resin glands were humongous on that. I've never seen bigger resin glands on any other cannabis, actually. So I did the red and yellow lines, the F1s. I kept them going and crossed them back together along the way. And uh, Shishkaberry 3, which was released from Switzerland, was a bit of a representation of all three parents in one. Yeah, okay. So it's interesting you touched on that consumer point because when I was looking through the Spice of Life catalog, so to speak, 
I like something that caught my eye was Donk. And the reason why was because of the fact that like one of the parents was like kind of more of a cash cropper type of thing from the description. Was that your attempt to kind of offer a more commercial strain? Yeah, the, you know what? That was uh, there was a couple of spice releases over the years, very few, but a couple that were done by a friend of mine, you know, or different friends. So one early on, I had a friend that did one uh, called, it was a cross of Mighty Might and Heavy Hammer, and we called it Heavy Hummer. So that was the first one that was just a seed. I hadn't grown, but I let out under my catalog because it was from one of my best friends. And I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. Let's put it out there because he wasn't going to start a seed company or anything. And then uh, the donk was sort of the same thing. It was a friend I had in the Kootenays and I was out visiting him and he was like, hey, I just crossed this. He's like, what do you think? And I was like, I was like, you know what? People love giant buds. <laughs> so let's say we put it out. Let's do it. So that was one that I didn't read, but I released. Okay, cool. Do you ever did you ever consider trying to make a strain purely to suit the consumer market, or were you just like, look, if something ends up yielding big, that's cool? Well, the consumer were the ones buying the big stuff from the growers. So the the home growers that cared a lot less, they might buy something like Rosebud. Now, I put, I don't remember exactly, but I figure Shishkaberry was listed in the grams per meter, grams per walk kind of thing a little bit, you know, on the higher side. Sweet Tooth in the middle, and most of them in the middle, whether it was the um, Blue Domino or Blockhead or other things. The But the Rosebud, I think I put on it Dismal for yield instead of you know heavy, medium, heavy, medium. I put dismal beside yield on the description of it, and people would say, What does dismal mean? And I'd say, eh, Maybe 50 grams a square meter, 70 grams a square meter. And they're like, Oh my god, that's nothing. Why would I grow that? <laughs> I taste it, you know. And they, if you're lucky enough to smoke a joint of it, you're like, Oh, fuck. I would grow that for the rest of my life just for myself. Nobody's ever going to be growing that to sell until it's wide open legal and they can afford the economy of scale. But a lot of the best tasting grass is the worst yielding grass. And that doesn't compute with the indoor grower in a prohibition scenario because they don't have the luxury of finding the luxury buyers that will pay extra to have something exotic. They have to have something you know, good looking generic bud. It's got to be fat, frosty, and green. That's the basic parameters of what they need to sell. They can't advertise it in, you know, rich and famous magazines so that Arnold Schwarzenegger can buy $1,000 grams of it because it's, it's, that market's not there yet. When it's wide open legal and it can be like an auction for Domaine Romani Conti. Like how many people get to drink a bottle of Romani, Domaine Romani Conti? Not very many, you know, they don't make a lot of wine. And as a result, you know, supply and demand dictates that that shit is expensive and it's a luxury good, you know? Yeah, without a doubt. There'll be buds like that too, where you think, geez, there's only X amount of this bud. Now the people that think you can grow high quality bud indoors are missing the point it's like they think you can make high quality wine out of wine kits it's not high quality you you might be okay with it but that doesn't mean it's actually high quality you know it's um there's more to it than just consistency the best tastiest things like that have a year on it because they're not consistent year to year they're a product of that year. And the year, the, the, the vintage of the harvest is it's as important to outdoor, you know, as the variety you're growing, let alone who was growing it or taking care of it and who was making sure it was cured well and dried well that year, you know? Like the same vineyard in France may be there for the last 200 years making fantastic first growth in Bordeaux that the winemakers changed every 20 years over that time. You know, the vineyard's still this famous thing. It's not the winemaker at that point. It's that land. That land expresses 
the, that variety the best. And that becomes recognized with time. And some of that time is, uh, you know, we're, we're at a true renaissance in cannabis right now. It really is a mind blowing time. If you're a cannabis lover to be alive, like I, I can remember when I was sort of started campaigning for it as it were, when I was like 14, 15 in high school debates or whatnot, and just talking to everybody, I said, well, cannabis has to be legal. It's just not fair. It's a herb. It doesn't make sense. It's part of the planet. Like it just struck me as evil and wrong from a very young age. And I never wasted a day not talking about it with people. But to think nowadays, it blows my mind. I was walking into dispensaries like a year or two ago and I'd see you know, electric joints, like pre-filled disposable oil pens with sweet tooth in them. And you're just like, if you had told me that in 96, you know, I would have believed, I always believed cannabis would be legal. But if you had told me, I'm going to walk into stores one day and people that don't know me are going to try selling me pen electric joints full of sweet tooth oil, I'm just going to be tickled pink. You know, I couldn't believe it. It was just... Like, holy shit, this is, a, <laughs> it's a whole new paradigm, you know? Yeah, totally. Something that has come up in the last few episodes, which you just touched on, is the idea of terroir. And more importantly, how can we, in this modern age, establish new appellations for cannabis? So what is your thoughts on that? Well, they're gonna, it's an excellent question. And I think it is certainly an underappreciated aspect of it's part of cannabis that seems obvious to me, but I know plenty of people, you know, they're still learning their varieties and they would rather have that well leached hydro and taste the pure varietal character. Absolutely got no problem with that. The, but the thing that is increased in the plant is in the terroir, it really brings out more and it adds something to it in a good way or a bad way, you know? So some places don't have a great terroir for grass. Some places do, and some they're just different. And places with limestone and with a lot of lime in the soil tend to give you limeier green buds that are sweeter. Limestone sweetens grass. It sweetens soil. People, That's how they describe it, sweetening soil. Limestone sweetens soil, and you see it sweetens grass. Um, the different pH affects the grass. Um, a lot of people will turn it down at the end in the hydro system so the plant shuts down and stops taking up so much nutrient. Each to their own. There's lots of ways to, what you're trying to whatever you're trying to do. But I, I know between Ontario and BC grass, the same varieties, I can generally taste which province it's from, even if it's grown in Rockwell. And that's to do with the water, not the soil. The, um, but it, you know, if you think of a one design race, is a good competition of the captain's skills or the skipper's skills. They're all racing the exact same little sailboat. And there's no technical advantage. It's really just the experience and skill of the captain. And with the clone, it, I would like to see competitions like this whereby grower gets the same clone and they might be in different scenarios, but they're all going to bring you back a different bud as a result. And if you take the same clone, say you took a clone of your favorite Mullumbimby Madness and you planted that in one part of Jamaica, another part of Jamaica, another part of Mexico, somewhere in California, somewhere in Oregon, somewhere in Ontario, I guarantee you, you're going to be able to tell the difference. You may not know where they're from, but you're going to be able to say, wow, this one really tastes different than this one. And often I find it is even clay. Like if there's some clay in the soil, you can taste the clay in the herb. And it, it is apparent. And, you know, this brings me back to uh, another sesh with DJ Short early on, maybe the second or third time I met him. And it was the first time I'd smoked his bud was at the uh, Melkweg at a cannabis cup in Amsterdam. And he'd uh, brought or sent over a few, uh, few of his buds from his backyard. And when we were smoking a joint of his flow, and it was the first time I'd ever smoked a joint of flow, and uh, he rolled this joint up and passed it to me. And 
I took one puff of it, or maybe even on the dry toast, maybe before I took a puff of it. Um, you might remember <laughs> if somebody wants to ask. I, I had the puff, it, whether it was dry or lit, and I said, huh, it tastes like beets. And he just looked at me and smiled, and he says, I grew that in my beets. Wow. <laughs> you know, so it comes through. Whatever you're putting it in comes through. So that flow had the terroir of beets because it was touching beets. It was coexisting with them and feeding off of them potentially. You know, it was wrapped around the beets. And it came through in the bud. And it was the first tasting note I gave him was, hey, it tastes like beets. And, and it did for a very good reason. So he was quite... Um, surprised, but and he pulled out his flavor wheel had been developing, and we realized we were uh, <laughs> both really into taste. <laughs> we both we, we both loved good cannabis flavors, and uh, he's a really zen man, and I always enjoyed his company. I haven't talked to him in a dog's age, so it wouldn't hurt. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, if people haven't picked on it, picked up on it thus far clearly a bit of a wine connoisseur what was it that uh inspired you to get into wine and what's your favorite type well wine is a, a parallel universe to cannabis they're both sort of mild flavorful intoxicants and that enhance everyday life you know i i enjoy wine as much as i enjoy cannabis probably are damn close and i wouldn't really say i have a favorite type but I like wine that's clean, not dirty, and I like it. And some people don't mind a little barnyard in that in it. I'm more technical. I like wine to be very clean, and I do like to try varietal wines. I also love having blended wines. You know, there's not a right or wrong that way, and it's not even a red or white thing. I appreciate every wine on its own merits, whether it's a Riesling or a Chardonnay or a pick pool or a columbard. One of my favorite white I had in Australia was a columbard from uh, Primo Winery in McLaren Vale, I believe. That was my favorite white I tried in Australia, and I was not expecting that much fruit from columbard. I don't think anyone in Canada grows it. I was actually thinking of planting some. <laughs> the, uh, but, yeah, I really enjoy wine, and I really get off on uh, learning about it from people that have been doing it more than me. And I've been doing uh, quite a while, 15 years I have made real wine, and that's half as long as I've done cannabis, but I've been doing it a lot more the last 15 than cannabis. So I would say at this point they're fairly even as far as terms of appreciation go and understanding the the thing is, I've got one friend who's got a vineyard of different clones of Pinot Noir, and he'll make a matrix of barrels with really high-end French barrels, but he'll maybe use four different forests with a couple different toast levels, and he'll have, like, say, three sets of those, of, so there's three sets of the same barrels, and then he'll take the three different clones of Pinot Noir and put one into one set of barrels, one into the other set of barrels, and one into the last set. So you might have clone 555 five, five, and 702, or whatever. I can't remember the numbers of the clones for the Pinot, but the, but the difference between each of those Pinots is apparent. But when you frame it in the different oaks, it gives you a different perception of them too. But after you've tried them in all the sets then against this matrix of them that it's really a lot of fun tasting and we end up taking breaks to smoke a joint and we end up blasted at the end of it and we listen to music <laughs> and it's all fun and we really have too much fun in our wine cellars but the uh but the flavors is what it's all about to us and we both love the nose and the taste and as you get to do it you can once you've done it enough, blindfolded, you could recognize those different Pinot Noirs. Now, most sommeliers, which people think of as real wine experts, they couldn't tell you what clone is in that Pinot Noir. You know, it's a next level of appreciation. You know, they can tell you it's Pinot Noir. They can probably tell you the producer, the country, the vintage. But can they break down what clones are in it? <laughs> you know? There's always somebody that knows more than you, you know, so it's really good when you can, when you're humble enough to accept that and lucky enough 
to learn from those people. You know, it's no point come out thinking you know everything because you never learn anything after that. You always keep learning. And if you enjoy stuff, you know, it's hard not to because you're obsessed with it. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So just out of a little personal curiosity, what's your favorite red? That's what I'm into. Oh, you know, I don't have one favorite. I, I rotate between between them like crazy. Like I I get, uh, I don't not like Shiraz, but I get tired of it quick. Yeah. Uh, really good Pinot, I never get tired of. Blackluster Pinot, can't take it, you know. <laughs> the uh, But I've been drinking uh, more South American wine lately because when I go down, I take some wine with me as gifts usually, but I like to drink some South American stuff when I go out in the restaurants. I'm always ordering Carmenere or something like that. I do like Carmenere, and I really love, like if I had to pick one fine wine, which is kind of what you're asking, I think I would take Brunello de Montalcino, which is typically fantastic examples of Sangiovese. And it gets Ooh, yeah. one of my favorite characteristics is red licorice. When they smell like red licorice. And some of my best uh, Merlots even, they'll smell like blackberry licorice, like the purple licorice. Ooh. Oh my God, if they smell like red or purple licorice, I'm in love. And roses too. And Brunello's one, I often get red licorice and roses. Those are the noses I want from red wine most of the time. You know, I'm open to black cherry and you name it. But but overall, if I had to pick one, like if you're saying, what's your favorite? I'd say, if I was stuck on the desert island, I would want a cellar full of 97 Brunellos. Yeah. I was in Switzerland when they came out in 2002, and they were divine. And I was supposed to stockpile a bunch and save it for a long time and, and or sell it back to my local wine merchant. And I drank them all way too young. <laughs> so if I could have anything back, give me a cellar full of 97 Montalcinos. There you go. Well, I mean, on a similar point of, you know, high-end connoisseur products, I wanted to know your thoughts on recently we've seen a small amount, or maybe you might say a little more than small, but an amount of controversy surrounding the recent sale of $100 eighths in the States. Do you feel like there's room for the extremely high-end cannabis market, or do you feel like we're forever banned well, absolutely. by it? I think, I think it's, it's not even the tip of the iceberg yet, because the very best producers historically could not make themselves known to the wider market. People saw some, but where'd you get that? I can't tell you, you know, <laughs> but once everybody's able to know, then the forces of supply and demand are going to drive the price of the best stuff up. And a hundred dollar each is a tip of the iceberg, man, for sure. And I've got nothing against that. If it was the only price for cannabis, I have something against that. But if you can go and buy a $20 eight beside it, of something still decent, I think that's fair. That's okay. There's only so much, you know. Let the let the consumers decide. If nobody will pay a hundred dollar eight, it'll go away. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's exactly what I've kind of been thinking. And and the underlying point of the discussion that I think gets missed is that no one who bought these eights was forced to. That's but, right. That's yeah. a free. It's free market. Free will. <laughs> whatever you want. So maybe one day I'll sell hundred dollar eights, but before I do, I want to sell ten dollar ounces. There you go. Well, something which I think is an interesting aspect of the whole discussion is that there are some people who say that we're forever as a market, so to speak, going to be bound or we should bound ourselves by the fact that to certain people, this is medicine. Do you think that that argument is going to be able to stand the test of time or it's a little faulty? I'm all for producing dirt cheap medicine and I'm putting my money where my mouth is and doing it. The, I, there's a big difference between people that need the molecule as medicine and people that want the sexiest bud. You know, you can have medicine in a, you know, a nondescript jar. It doesn't have to be the sexiest bud. It can be a dropper. It can be a pill. It can be a potion, you know, a cream that you rub on your hands. People want to buy boutique bud. That's different than the medical market. 
do medical people deserve boutique buds? Absolutely. But if they don't learn to grow them themselves, they're going to have to learn to pay for them. And if, if they're not happy with just the raw ingredient, because mass produced field grown will make the medical compounds very, very affordable. So if medical's your thing, probably a tincture works for you, right? Yeah. So if tinctures can, my plan for first world pricing is I can keep somebody medicated on field grown tinctures for a dollar a day retail. So if all the patients can be covered for a dollar a day, that's going to work for all, but the absolute poorest humans, you know, it's going to work for most of the humans that have access to any sort of pharmaceutical, <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. If yes. you can buy aspirin, you should be able to buy cannabis and it shouldn't be reserved for the rich, but that's not to say that boutique bud can't be for the rich. That <laughs> absolutely can be. And it always has been. Yeah, definitely. So just to wrap up our kind of little discussion of talking around the world, the different terroirs and whatnot, as we've referenced a few times already recently, you were down under and you also went a few other places. What was your impression of the various cannabis scenes and places where you stopped in? Well, I can tell that there's an appreciation amongst many Aussies for cannabis and there is an absolute ignorance about it by the majority. So democracy is Greek for oppressing minorities, I believe, is the translation. But, uh, <laughs> like, but, the, but as a minority, cannabis lovers in Australia face an uphill battle because they have a very authoritarian regime descended from the queen, and they really are not nice about cannabis in Australia overall. And you and many others recommended I don't travel with any, even domestically, which I never even think about in Canada. I just threw it in my bag and away I go. But um, down there, you guys told me not to travel domestically with it, and I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't, because everywhere I went, I heard the same thing, say, oh, don't bring it in your bag. You, you won't get there with it. So it was uh, it, it was kind of hard for me, and a little bit sad to go back to seeing it um, where people were – had to be a lot more covert about it still. And it, it took me back. And in a way, it was kind of a, an amusing nostalgia, but it was disappointing at the same time because I know there's solid people keeping it real, case in point yourself. But, you know, you still got to mind your P's and Q's to not have the neighbor turn you in, you know? It's all... Uh, it's hard, yeah. you know? And a lot of the world, you think of the people getting death penalties for cannabis and stuff. It's just... Too much, you know? Why did people feel that entitled to rule us? I don't get it. I don't uh, I don't consent to be ruled in that way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, one thing I wanted to quickly ask you, because I should have said it earlier, but it slipped my mind. You mentioned Blockhead, and I think you, you know, kind of talking about Bodhi and how he was using it and stuff. One of the things I found interesting about that was I think a lot of people would have got exposure to Blockhead through Snow Lotus because I think that, you know, got a lot of traction. Absolutely. So, yeah, how did, how did you feel about that when you realized that there was that was incorporated and then it was taking off in its own right, the Snow Lotus, so to speak? That, that I loved. That I loved. I want people to use them in their own stuff. That's what it's for. And I want, and I love to see their recognition when they say, hey, I made the Snow Lotus, it's half Blockhead and half whatever else. That's cool. That's cool as shit. I got no problem with that. Even if you want to make straight up block off knockheads, if you call them square dome and put blockhead in brackets, say I made this from a blockhead back cross, that's cool too. I have no problem with that. It's just when if I if there's a potential for customers to be confused down the road, which they have if they have the authentic one or they've got this next version of it, you know, that that can that uh, leads to confusion that bothers me. I've got absolutely no problem, and I do wish the guy all the best because I know when I didn't talk to him ever directly, but I know um, his uh, his friends 
were speaking for him and were apologetic and, and said, uh, don't worry, the guy's going to just continue that. And he'd give you the rest of the seat. I said, I don't want anything from him. I'm, I'm happy. He doesn't have to even stop selling them. I'd rather he just change the name. And you can still call it blockhead, back cross in brackets. It's what it is. That's fine. But call it something that identifies it as yours so that when other people get it, they don't see, oh, well, this isn't the same as the blockhead I had the first time or whatever, you know? I'm not trying, I'm not really not trying to be a dick about it. I just want people to, you know, it's really cool when they respect the origins of what they're using. I always tried to do that myself, but I always gave stuff an original name too, because what you release is yours. Yeah. Not mine, you know? So, I mean, on the topic of Blockhead, I did want to ask, it's one of those ones which also has, or at least online, it commonly says that it uses an unknown strain as one of the parents. Are you able to tell us a little bit about that one? It was the same father as the Sweet 2-3, the DX2P1, which is the most stable male they had for hitting anything, and really a, a vigorous specimen. It had very thick, dark green leaves. It was pretty much impervious to mildew. It was just a, a real champion of a dad, that one. But I used that one on a Product 19, which came from an American grower named Seuss. And he was in Vancouver for a while. He came up from Oregon, and he had a couple of his own strains, and he kept them close to himself. And he sold the bud downtown once in a while, and some people would get a seed or whatnot. And... Um, this one guy that claimed to have done some trimming for him owed me some money, and he came by and said, well, I don't have that money I owe you, but I got paid in seeds from trimming for Seuss. So he says, if you want, I would, uh, I can pay you back in seeds. And he owed me money for a long time. I didn't even know if the seeds were really from Seuss or what. I just said, you know what, let's see, what have you got? So I just took the seeds in lieu of the debt. And I didn't grow them out in Canada, but I took them with me to Switzerland. And there was two kinds. There was a BKS, which was like big Korean skunk. And I never actually did anything with that. I think the seeds got stolen even. The, um, and the other one was product 19, or P19 for short. That was the unknown mother, if anywhere says it was unknown. It, it was the P19, Product 19, or Project 19. I was never clear on it. We just always called it P19. Whether it was Project or Product, I wasn't clear on. But it was really weird, dude. The, the guy was a super weird dude. And I was always under, you know, I was always wondering if it was the grass that made him weird or if he made his grass weird. Because his vibe, because he had a weird vibe to him, but his grass did too. So you smoke his grass and it was really a strong, but almost off-putting for a lot of people. And I know people would say, I smoked that. I was looking out the curtains, paranoid and wigging out. Like some people really got a wig out on, <laughs> on some of the strains. So it was really unusual stuff and it was totally unrelated to everything else in my stable. And so I planted those, and I found one really sharp mother out of it that I liked better than the rest. And she was a big, chunky, frosty thing. And it had a very unusual aroma, almost uh, vinyl. Like, you know, sometimes a Riesling has a vinyl smell. It was very similar to that. It had this, uh, you know, kind of an artificial smell. And the... And the quality of the resin was very unusual, too. It was extremely greasy. And when you made bubble hash from it, it actually would, when you put the hash on the drying screens, it would melt through the drying screens. Even if you put it on like a 15, when you went to pick it up, it was stuck to whatever was underneath it. And you just couldn't handle it unless it was frozen. It was really the, the greasiest resin I've ever seen. It was really unusual, and it was always a certain color, like, um, yeah, bizarre, but it was strong, and it definitely uh, it put the wig out on a lot of people, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it routinely, I never had it uh, tested in the lab, but I would see growers in the States that had access to testing, and they would post results of it cracking 30 every time, basically. Every time I saw uh 
a blockhead analysis, it was over 30%. So that that's, you know, not extremely common. And it particularly wasn't 20 years ago. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to bring up a comment made by one of our past guests, Shabad of 707 Seed Bank. I think I've seen you even, you know, kind of in briefly interacting with him in the comments, but he's um, played with the blockhead a little bit, doing some various filial projects and whatnot. And a comment he made which really grabbed my attention was he said, all of Breeder Steve's stuff, you grow it outdoors, but it looks like it's indoors. And he said it's like all, all these strains are like that, and you just you never see that across a lot of breeders. Have you heard that comment yourself? And if so, like why do you yeah, think that's all the, the case? Time. And I know why that's the case. And I told you earlier was uh, I always do a selection round outside every year, and then two inside. So there was always every year every strain was being selected to work outside but it was also selected twice more to work inside. So most breeders don't take the effort to do selections outside and that their plants don't work outside. Yeah, okay, that's interesting because he said that it was such a benefit because, you know, like he said it a bit tongue-in-cheek, but he said, you know, like he could pass it off for like much more at dispensaries because they thought it was indoor. Constantly, You know what? I've seen this so many times and I hear all these people, especially today too, now that Canada is going to allow outdoor and all these people say, yeah, but outdoor sucks. You, I was like, fuck, you couldn't even tell the difference if I gave you some proper outdoor. <laughs> you wouldn't have a clue because it looks just as good and it may taste even better. You know, so outdoor bud can be, I mean, bud is bud. If the plant is healthy and reaching its full potential, there's literally no telling if it was indoor or outdoor if it was abused outdoor yeah, it looks like outdoor if it was grown somewhere where it doesn't really work it looks like bad outdoor but if it's somewhere where it's happy and and acclimatized there's no reason you would ever know if it was indoor or outdoor and the people that tell you that are simply haven't experienced that yeah totally Alrighty, well that brings us to the tail end of the interview where we've got our little quick fire questions. So, first one I wanted to shoot you away. What's the most memorable weed or hash or concentrate, you know, anything anything with cannabis, so to speak, most memorable experience you've ever had with it? That's a tough one, man. <laughs> That's a tough one. I think I can break it down a bit. I'll say the most memorable weed was the second year I grew that Northern Lights. That stuck in my head and calibrates my bud forever. The nicest hash, the most spectacular hash I ever had that I made was uh, the incredible blue satellite, the, the blueberry sativa mother. The full melt I pulled off of her looked like tiger's eye, that gem. You could see into it like rays of gold into this amber chunk. It was so spectacular. I did have pictures of that a long time ago, this tin I had it in. It was really something. I've never seen hash that looked like that before or since. That blew me away. The biggest, the best hit I ever had was at uh, Legends of Hashish at the Lebanese restaurant in Amsterdam. And Dave pulled out his... Uh, old Afghan hookah, like a traditional one that was really like a family keepsake. It was maybe 200 years old or something like this. It was a very, uh, very ornate, beautiful old hookah with a solid wood pipe stem on it. And the bowl, he loaded up the bowl as he does with uh, full, full melt dry sift and it was like seven-year-old haze resin or something like this, an absolute full melt. And he literally packed grams of it into this bowl, and it's a room full of hash makers and hash dealers and hash lovers in, that we've taken over this restaurant. And he goes, sets up the thing, and he says, who's going to help me light this? And nobody in the room wanted to stand up and go over and hit it. And he said, come on, guys, who's the fucking stoner here? Who's, who's hardcore? Come on, who's going to help me light this? So he was ready with his wooden matches to light this big stinky bowl of, of haze melt. <laughs> I remember going, 
I was embarrassed because nobody would get up there all looking around like, no way, I'm not going to light that thing. They were all, you know, happy to smoke little pipes of it. And, of course, it was a really extravagant hit, and everybody knew it was going to be a lung buster, you know, and going to drop them. And that was one of one of two times in my life I had temporary amnesia from cannabis. And I went, I said, I oh, fuck it. I got up, went over to the middle of the room, crouched down, took the wooden stem in my hand, and he, he's like, okay, give it a big big huff, get a couple of big huffs to get the thing going. And I was like, okay. I take this big lung-busting blast off of this thing and stand up and whew, bust a lung for a second and go back to my table and sit down by the window at my table and I'm looking out the window at the sort of Amsterdam street scene outside going by and a minute later or so I look at the people at my table and I'm like I don't know who any of these people are and I'm looking around the room but I don't know who any of these people are and I was looking out the window going fuck I don't even know where I am and then I was like what's my name? And I couldn't remember my name. You know, like I literally couldn't remember my name. And I knew it was that I was just really stoned and it was going to pass. But it was weird because I really had this genuine temporary amnesia from that one blast of lighting that damn hookah. That was a legendary hit. I will never forget that. That was, I'll be eternally grateful to Dave for that bloody hit as it stoned me to the bone. And it was great. But, I mean, after five minutes or something, you know, I just sat there quietly. Nobody realized I was kind of tripping out. They must have assumed I was tripping out. But, you know, once I got going, a few people went over and took a puff of it. Dave was puffing away on it. He's hardcore. But, man, oh, man, I was lit from that. And after a minute, you know, a couple of minutes, I was sort of like, okay, I know where I am now. I can drink the beer. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> You're good. But that was a blast, man. The, so for the grass... Um, hash and best hit. Was there another question? Yeah, it's it's a follow up. Is Dave a CIA agent? <laughs> well, he probably puffed the toughest of all of them. If he is, I would uh, I would not say he's a CIA agent. I can understand why some people are suspicious of Americans that get off lightly and disappear into foreign scenes. I can see the issue, and I think many people facing what uh, these people are facing in those scenarios would probably do what they had to to not die in prison. But I really don't think the guy's a CIA agent. (laughs) Well, there you go. That answers the question. So next one. The opposite end of the spectrum, instead of the most memorable experience, well, maybe it's the same question in a different way. What was the most memorable worst experience? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, one that, one that pissed me off was when I was younger and I was, I don't know, 18 or 19 and I was traveling around uh, Central America for a winter and I was on an island, Key Cocker in Belize. And there was a Rasta about my age named Jimmy the Lion. And he had some nice bud from Orange Walk and Corazol, northern Belize. He was out at the island, and I said, hey, man, I'll buy some of that bud off you, and we can all smoke it together, because I was the visiting backpacking tourist with a few bucks, and they were poor locals. But I said, let me buy some of that bud off you, and we'll just smoke it together, because that's nicer than a lot of the Belizean bud I'd seen. So I told them, I said, listen, because it's a small island and there's a cop riding in circles around on a bike, checking us out suspiciously wherever you went. And I said, let's go to, there was a palapa at the end of this dock. It was a private dock. It was ours. And we just went out there. We sat in the rafters with his radio and I said, let's put all the weed into one big joint. We'll smoke it. And then we're going into the beach to do some fishing And then we barbecued fish over coconut husks with a grill popped up on four coconuts and the lime tree behind us to squeeze lime on the fish. And I'd give another rest a few bucks to go get some rice and he'd grate coconut and we'd boil the rice. So we would have like this rasta cookout going on the beach and we were smoking a joint and I'd said, put all the weed in that joint. 
so that if the cop comes by, we can ditch the joint and nobody has anything on them, you know? And he'd, he'd told me, okay, yeah, I put it all in this big fat joint. We would roll it in banana leaves because you couldn't get papers. And the banana leaves or almond leaves weren't too bad, even if you got them the right uh, age. But the, this cop drive by that looked like a kid on a bike. He must have been like 18 or something. And he had his shorts and a camo T-shirt and a black beret. And I was like, was that, was that one of the cops? And he's like, yeah. And then I'm like, swat the joint out of their hand because there's about five or six of us. There was a few hippies from California in that circle and a few locals. And as the cop drove by, he was looking at the joint and then looking at me and just staring me straight in the eye because somebody was trying, the Californian dread was trying to pass me the joint. And he was talking to people on the other side of him. And he was totally oblivious to this little kid cop on the bike riding by us on the beach. And I and so as soon as the guy got past a bush, I was like, he's going to come back. So I swat the joint out of the guy's hand. And with my left toe, I pushed it into the sand. And that cop was running right back over with his gun out. <laughs> he, you know, he didn't have his gun out. He came running back over yelling. He's like, hey, you need me to go get the gun? Because he was saying something about, yeah, you need to go get the gun if we didn't cooperate. Because we're all bigger than him. And he's like, you all got to cooperate with me. And he's going off to us. So he goes around and he comes straight to me and searches me first. And the only thing I have on is a bathing suit with my room key in it. Nothing else. And I'm standing on the joint. And so he's checking my pockets. And he goes, okay, where, so where'd you do with the joint? I saw you were going to have it. I was like, I don't have a joint. And uh, so then he went around the circle and checked everybody. And Jimmy the Lion still had a bud in his pocket that he didn't put in the joint. And uh, so they busted him and dragged him into their little shitty one-room uh, police station kind of with the cell underneath it. And... He, I, I was a couple doors down at the little hotel I was staying or hostel or whatever. And all night that guy sang Bob Marley songs through the bars and he kept the whole island awake. It was, but I was, I just stayed there the whole night, just feeling like so bad that this poor bastard is hauled in. And now that, you know, they may take him to the jail in, in Belize city, which is a real shitty, shitty jail. And I thought, this nice young Rasta guy for one fucking herb stock, you know? And I just, I've, that has always been the worst buzz kill is when you're enjoying a beautiful buzz with wonderful people and really having a good environment. And then the man comes in and kicks sand in your face, you know? And it's like, fuck you guys. I really have no respect for the law. And it's just because of pot laws. Yeah, totally. Okie dokie, so next one, if you were on a desert island and you could only have two or three strains, what would you pick? Mm. Yeah, real original Colombian gold, maybe that rosebud, <laughs> or the, and, uh, and the sweetest of the sweet tooth. The, the real sweet, sweet tooth had a real grape candy taste, like grape po lollipops almost. You see, I, I had uh, friends from California that thought it was grape ape when they came to visit me one time. They spoke and they're like, this is just like grape ape. It's been around a long time. And I was like, well, this is a new cross, but I can see if maybe has similar parents or something. And uh, my favorite sweet tooth is actually some of my favorite herbs of all time. There's a real sweet tooth. There's nothing sweeter. Like just for straight up rot your teeth sweet flavor, that's it. And it didn't have any other characters that I didn't like. Some herb that's a little bit sweet might have some kind of rot or other smells too that I don't like as much, but the best sweet tooths were my favorite for the candy flavored herb. The original Colombian gold is my favorite for a real high cherry note and like an absolute succulent perfume. <sighs> totally love it. But if I had to take a third herb, I think the mother of that rosebud, that little popcorn flow it just was like chocolate and you never have grass. Like I had a couple of chocolate herbs, but nothing that chocolate. Like it was real hashy chocolate taste. It really reminded me of the police temple bowl, the real stuff. So I think those three would be diverse enough to satisfy my palate. If I could only have three. Okie dokie. It's a good selection. So 
if you could have one strain back that you'd lost over the years, which one would you get back? Oh, that's a good question. There's been a few, but I think it wouldn't be a strain per se, but a selections I've had of a strain that were uh, the old, only time I've seen true sterile females. I really regret losing those cuttings. <laughs> those, I had uh, seeds. There was a release I had called Tight Skunk. It was a Ryan's Killer. It was the bag seed mother. We call it Ryan's Killer. Um, and when I grew out the Ryan's Killer, which was when eights of pot were $40 in Vancouver, twice a year this one guy came out with some that was a friend of a friend, and she was selling uh, herb. And she sold this other guys for 40 but when this Ryan guys came out from the lower mainland, it was 55 It was like, wow, 55 and why? <laughs> and they were like, well, it is very nice. And she's like, it's super strong. Dry. So I'd try some and go, okay, it's really different too. It had a real sandalwood smell and taste. So everybody in my house got an eighth, and they all found a couple seeds. And they gave them to me. So I sprouted them, and I got six plants up. All three were females. Three of them had pistols, and three of them had no pistols. And the ones with no pistols would not take a seed, covered in pollen, with males right all over them. They would not make a seed. So I actually had the perfect example of sterile females. Now, I've heard of a, a number of people have messed around trying to make them through various techniques. Um, and they're generally trying to induce polyploidy. And I've gone back in oh, my mind a million times about what people were doing back then. And I've got a pretty good idea how to get back to it. And it's a little different than what most people are trying. So I don't want to say much more about it because I feel like it's like a great arms race right now that whoever comes out with the sterile female first wins. Because what that does for outdoor cultivation is nothing short of evolutionary. If you've got a problem with hemp in your neighborhood, which many Canadians do, they can't grow outdoors. There's too much hemp around them. If, they had, if we could uh, induce sterility into their plants without otherwise making them different, it would be a huge game changer. And even indoors, producers will have a Hermie. And I've seen, you know, customers of the biggest LPs in Canada complain about getting seeds in their bud. Like, come on, people. You shouldn't still be selling CD bud if you're not trying to sell CD bud. So it would be really easy to correct that for all of them. I could take a cutting from anybody and send it back to them sterilized in a few months. And the only difference in the bud would be that it didn't have any pistols. So that was really an amazing plant to find. Nobody I've ever talked to's ever seen a similar one. Obviously, whoever else grew those seeds saw it, but probably didn't realize the significance of it at the time, as I didn't, because I'd only been growing for less than 10 years at that point, and I just thought, hey, I've just never seen this before, but I'm sure I'll see it again. <laughs> and I never saw it again. So I really, really, really regret letting those go. When I'd left that, the house where I had them, I sold the lease to a friend and I wanted to move to another house out on the ocean, which was gorgeous. But when I, I said, listen, I'm going to move out there. I'll sell you the lease on my place. The grow room's set up. All the plants are there, equipment, it's all yours. So I sold him the place and I left. And I said, I'm going to come back in a couple of months when I get something else set up. I'll come back and get cuttings and everything. And when I came back, he'd cleaned out like half the stuff. I was like, and he lost them. He's like, oh, I lost this, and I lost that one, too. He was like, oh, no. I was like, fuck, I was just killing myself that I didn't spread it around a little bit more. Because the strains that I was so proud of early on and shared far and wide, they're still, a, they're still around. They're more far and wide than they ever were because people have shared them on, in an ongoing way. So, like, a sweet skunk, you know, there's so much sweet skunk or grapefruit in BC, let alone in the West Coast, it'll never be gone because it's out there. It's, you know, it would be like trying to get rid of oxygen at this point. There's so much of it out there, you're just never going to get rid of it. Yeah, 
No, totally. Okay, so on to our lucky last question. If you could go back in time to one place to collect land race seeds, any place, any point in time, where would you go and what would you get? Hmm. I think I would go to Equatorial Africa 2019. (laughs) <laughs> I love the good African equatorial streams. There's Congo, Nigerians, and uh, Angolans. And I don't think they've changed that much <laughs> in the last thousand years, you know. Maybe they have, but I don't know. They they, uh, they really have uh, some amazing aromas and a little different effect in that they're a little higher in THCV than many other places. Uh, I, yeah, it's not that I need to go back in time. I just need to go and travel through some of these areas that I think still hold amazing land race stuff, you know? Like if you go to Angola, the chances of everything being polluted with blue kush are pretty low. (laughs) But if you smoke Angolan, and I know friends in BC that grow Angolan, it's fabulously delicious. It really is. And it's, it's up there with some of the Asian ones, but I think it's a little bit better even than like Burmese and Vietnamese and that. I tend to like the Africans just a hair better than the Asians. And I like the Asians, but I love the Africans. So that's where I would, for land race collection, that's where I would want anything from equatorial Africa. Yeah, what a fantastic answer. So with that being said, did you have any comments or shout outs you wanted to make? Well, shout out to everybody that ever supported me in this endeavor and uh, your encouragement's always meant a lot. I would have done it for my own selfish pleasure, as I said. I love to do it. But, you know, the vindication I felt from all the people that ever helped me along the way, my gurus that uh, mentored me and took me in to a degree, like it wasn't like they became my parents or anything, but, you know, I got a lot of good advice from some really good people over the years and, uh, I think, you know, as one out of the blue, I would take that Tom Alexander from Sense Amelia Tips I'd brought up earlier because I never made the point out of that one I wanted to make was they had a study following Sense Amelia Tips. He had Growing Edge, and they had a study I remember reading that showed that organic produce, I think they did it on tomatoes, the study, that it provided, they had an organic one and a non-organic tomato, and the non-organic tomato had the primary flavonoids of a tomato. You could tell it tasted like a tomato. It was a tomato. But the organic stuff grown in compost and whatnot had developed secondary flavonoids. So they were able to quantify the improved flavor in the organic produce through the appearance of primary and secondary flavonoids. That study confirmed what I felt that organic pot tasted better and i always thought organic you know your backyard tomatoes taste better than those pink ones at the supermarket and it really you know shout out to tom alexander for sense amelia tips and then onwards and growing edge and the science of people growing kind bud and especially you know i've got to thank anybody that ever bred seed in this planet before me because we all stand on the shoulders of giants you know and I really, you know, have nothing but respect for guys like DJ Short and even um, Watson, what he's done with Skunk and Robert Connell Clark, you know, without his book, Marijuana Botany, I'm sure I would have been off to a much slower start, but that was the second grow book I ever read. And that uh, really blew it up for me and brought it into perspective. And I'd read it after, you know, I think the first year I grew, and then I got some books, and that was one of the very first books I got. And I read it and would look at the drawings of the different lines and think, wow, there's so much cannabis to experience beyond, you know, the Sensi catalog. <laughs> so it was really a treat to, it was really inspirational. Robert Connor Clark, I really uh, felt a debt of gratitude to him for his excellent work, and he's done a great job. Um, I'm sure there's lots more people I could thank, but this has been a very long show already, and I'm sure you're all ready to go roll another one. 
<laughs> That's a good little sentiment to end it on. So thank you so much, Brita Steve, for coming and dropping all the knowledge and all the awesome history. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Thank you again for your hospitality. It's a pleasure to call you a friend, my friend. Thanks to Brita Steve for taking the time to sit down and chat with us. And thanks to everyone who made it this far with us. As always, please go check out our sponsors, support them, 420 Australia, Organic Gardening Solutions, and Seeds Here Now. You know them best in the game. Finally, if you feel like you're a real fan, you know, feel like you're like the Keeper Fino of a fan, maybe you're going to go check out the Patreon. Till next time. I'll see you. Hello.